like scared. Don't be scared. We're just telling. Yes. Yes. Uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome to our VRBPS senior presentation for 2024. Uh, these guys are working hard. Very excited to see their presentations. Um, first up, we've got Carson Blackman, and she's going to tell us a lot about hydroponics. I'm very interested in hydroponics. All right, let's go back to the Okay. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm so excited to be starting these presentations today. As he said, my name is Carson Botkin, and I'm here today to tell you all about hydroponics. So some of you may have heard the term before, but might not know what it is. Growing a plant hydroponically means you're growing it without using any soil at all, using only water. Now, to do this process, you put your plant in a stabilizing material. Now, a lot of people use like pebbles or rice, currently pictured is the name brand, which is called Hydrogen, and it is a little clay pellet full of lots of air and nutrients that help support the plant and give it the things it needs to grow. Then you put your plant under lighting, whether this be artificial or natural, and you set it up, make sure the pH and PPM is right, and for the most part, it will flourish on its own. Currently pictured is a pepper plant that is in a artificial lighting hydroponic tent. This is just a picture to see how the roots can grow and develop on their own without any soil. I think it's a very cool thing to see firsthand, and I think that this picture displays it pretty well. So my quote of quality was, together we can continue to find more ways to increase food production and protect our, nat our precious natural environment. Only then will we truly be living with the land. This quote really stuck out to me, because it follows the, my project perfectly. Hydroponics is a form of sustainable agriculture, so it helps keep our environment safe, but provides people with the food they need to stay safe. Um, it also inspired me because it's a part of why I picked hydroponics. So for those of you who know me, you know I'm a huge Disney fan. And one of my favorite things in Disney is a small ride called Living with the Land. This ride is a boat type ride that takes you through a greenhouse and shows you all kinds of different gardening, growing, and plant techniques throughout the whole thing. Towards the end of the ride, there is a, a section full of sustainable agriculture. And I saw this hydroponic setup while I was there last May, and I just knew that this is what I was supposed to do my project on. For my research, I researched what are the major benefits of hydroponics as a form of sustainable agriculture. There are very, very many benefits. Some of the biggest being it can be done anywhere. So places where it's really cold and really dark like Alaska, or places where it's hot and dry like Kenya, can use hydroponics to grow food to provide fresh food for people there. It is also very good because it is very space saving. You can grow vertically using hydroponics. Another big benefit of hydroponics is you can treat wastewater with it. So a lot of wastewater that ends back up in our watersheds is full of runoff and different chemicals from farming. So we can collect this runoff and put it into hydroponic systems to reuse that fertilizer and help the plant flourish on its own. It's also good for like treating the water and getting fresh water. The biggest benefit of hydroponics is that you can reuse the water. So a lot of large-scale plantations currently waste a lot of water because it doesn't actually reach the roots of the plant. This happens a lot in big areas like the Salinas Valley in California. It is one of the largest plantations and grows a lot of the foods that we eat every day. Now, this plantation uses tons and tons of water from the Colorado River and is really a main cause of the reason it is being depleted. Using hydroponics, we can reuse this water and put it back into systems to keep using and save our water and try to build it back up. For my professional learning experience, I worked at the fifth season in Charlottesville. Um, during my internship, I helped clean the store, whether that be just cleaning or sweeping, putting things back that were misplaced. I also worked with the customers there, answering their questions, 
helping them find things, checking them out at the register. And a lot of people were just curious about my project and why I was there. So I had a lot of one-on-one -on -one conversation with the customers. The biggest thing I did during my internship was work in the hydroponic section with my two mentors, Austin and Zeke. Zeke Weiss is the man on the left and Austin Hall is on the right. They were two plant science specialists that graduated from their colleges with plant science degrees and they were the hydroponic specialist in the fifth season. Both of them were so, so, so impactful to this presentation because they knew so much. Zeke knew tons about the impact of hydroponics and why it's a good thing. He told me about the Salinas Valley and t said, look into it more, research. And then Austin knew just everything there was to know about actually doing hydroponics and setting up a hydroponic system. I went into it knowing nothing, so he taught me all about pH, ppm, nutrient levels, how to clean properly, what plants grow well hydroponically, what plants don't, how long it should take, just basically everything there was to know about hydroponics, he taught me. My favorite thing about my mentors was their incredible patience. As I said earlier, I went into it knowing nothing, so they taught me so much and it was so impactful and inspiring to myself. So these are two things that I grew during my internship. You can see a flower on the left, and those are just some of the roots that are showing. That was about three weeks of development, and I thought it was so pretty and so cool to actually see those roots. And on the right are two peppers I grew during my internship. These peppers may look small, but to me, they are so, they have such a big impact because this is actually my third attempt of growing peppers. So the first time I tried, the pH was way too high in my setup and those um, plants actually just like burned and I came back and there were just little crumbs of leaves left. And that was pretty, pretty um, like just sad and I was a little disappointed. However, Austin told me it happens, you're, you're learning, you're new. And we set it back up again and I left and I came back the next week and my plants had just wilted away. We were unsure of what happened. Austin says that in hydroponics, there is natural error. So it could have just been the plant was diseased to start or that there was not proper cleaning done in the materials we used beforehand. However, I was still disappointed. So we set it up one last time and on the last day of my internship, I went back and I saw these two beautiful red peppers and I was so proud of myself and what I had accomplished. I got to see somebody buy those peppers and take them home that day and it was just really cool for me to see how hydroponics works and that it can actually be such a good thing for everyone to learn how to do. For my community service, I did it here at Fluvanna County High School working with my mentor and advisor, Mr. Morrison. I gave a presentation to some of the local science, environmental science, and agricultural classes. So in this presentation, I basically just talked about the benefits of hydroponics and why it's a good idea to look into sustainable agriculture. And I thought that this project was pretty impactful because a lot of students were engaged with me. They actively paid attention, they would ask me questions, some had one-on-one -on -one conversations with me, and I even had a few find me later in the day and talk to me more about hydroponics. So I thought that the impact of this was pretty, pretty large and that I actually did get some people to look at more into sustainable agriculture. So my advice for future students is to do something you love. I was born and raised in Fluvanna County and I've always been connected to nature. I was always outside when I was a kid playing in the woods with my siblings. I currently spend a lot of time on the lake outside my house and I did a lot of the plant classes within the school and the different agricultural classes with the greenhouse. So doing this had me already comfortable with the, top, the topic and I was very passionate about the topic. So it helped motivate me to look more into it. I never found myself bored. I never found myself just kind of in a slum where I didn't want to do it. I was so into the project that I really wanted to know more. So my future plans are to attend the University of Virginia. And once I graduate, I want to become an ultrasound technician. What I learned about myself during this project is that I really do have a passion for sustainable agriculture. I think that I have found a lifelong hobby with doing hydroponics and currently I am growing some herbs hydroponically for my mom to use in our kitchen. Are there any questions? Yes. What 
So initially hydroponics is a little expensive, especially on like a large scale. So it takes a little more money to get started. However, once you factor in like how long it will last and the money you would have to spend on like fertilizers and maintaining soil health, it comes out to be about the same price in the end. So it does cost a little more upfront. Yes. So in my house, um, at the fifth season, they sell a lot of the things you need to grow hydroponically. So it came out to be about like 50 bucks, but I've been doing it for like a while. So it really like, it was 50 bucks at the start and I haven't had to buy anything new to like maintain it. So it's pretty cheap, like when you consider buying fertilizer for like a garden. Okay. Good morning. All right. So, starting along, this is my senior capstone presentation. I worked many hours, but quickly, who am I? So, my name is Tyler Nelson. I'm a senior here at Fluvanna County High School. I'm, I'm in the BRVGS program, and I'm hoping to graduate with a um, advanced diploma from Fluvanna County High School and continue on to college. So, what did I actually do? So, my topic was civil engineering. A quick little overview, civil engineering is the field of engineering which studies the design, creation, planning of infrastructure. So things such as roads, buildings, bridges, basically if you go into a city, everything around you is what can be considered infrastructure and a civil engineer most likely had their hand in the design of it. So why did I really choose it? it from, from an early age, I like designing. I like creating things. I like modeling, design, creation. Um, I also had good leaning towards it because my uncle is a mechanical engineer, so I had a good start into engineering. So I was interested in it already, and I was since I wanted to pursue it in college, I decided let me learn about it further and do some research into it before I really choose what I want to do. So what did I really look into? So my research question was what was the purpose of safety in civil engineering? This kind of fell into about maybe two main topics. One, why was, safe, why was safety important? Like, what was the purpose in it? And you might say that might be kind of simple, but it can be a little more important. It can be a little more interesting than that. It can be a little more advanced. But also, how is it accounted for? How do civil engineers work around making sure that their designs are safe and ensure that they work properly and they're just good for the environment and things of that sort? So, again, it's a pretty, it's a very important variable. 
it's one of the main things that they'll focus around. So, I, I, all my research papers specifically, I focused around three main topics. Traffic, environmental, and um, the specific safety measures they use to measure safety and ensure that designs are safe and will continue to be safe. So traffic impact, so if you create a new building in an area, even in a new area, uh, the existing area, there's gonna be more traffic as one would expect. But not on top of that, there's gonna be more traffic, which means there's higher crash incidents. There's gonna be, you have to account for building maybe new roads, you have to account for new parking lots, more traffic. You also have to account for roadway utilities, so things such as maybe stoplights, and how you're gonna power said stoplights, and crosswalks, and all of that is under very strict safety metrics and requirements by a lot of different uh, bodies and organizations. Um, additionally, you wanna make sure that you're using sustainable materials, you wanna make sure your design will continue to be sustainable, you don't completely destroy the environment around it, um, especially some certain variables you may not usually consider, such as maybe um, runoff, so, and some of the chemicals that may leach into the environment from your new design. And you, to see such ideas, there's a lot of safety metrics. So there's a lot based on, excuse me, um, damage metrics and maybe like future damage. You can, there are certain metrics you can use to find how damaged things will be in the future and when they need repairs and when you need to worry about repairing them and when, if they're safe, safe enough to um, protect against certain environmental impacts, such as maybe forest fires, high wind speeds, earthquakes, depending on the area you're in. So to learn more about it, I did my professional learning experience at Bowman Consulting, which is a civil engineering consulting firm, which is um, a large group across the US, mostly along the East Coast. Um, I specifically worked in their branch in Richmond, Virginia, right near us, and so I spent my time shadowing different civil engineers and learning about their work and following them in their work. They were, I shadowed many different civil engineers, which we'll see in a moment, who were very nice enough to spend, take time out of their work day to educate me on more what they do, and they were incredibly friendly and nice the entire way through. It was amazing working with them. So first up, on the left, we have one of the civil engineers I worked with, he was at the moment model modeling in AutoCAD, which is a modeling software usually for engineering. Um, on the right is one of the meetings I was in with my mentor, Mr. Jonathan Jackson, who we will get to in just a moment. Um, I sat in um, multiple different meetings to split up my time shadowing because there's a lot of meetings in project management as one would expect. <laughs> Um, on the left, we now have Mr. Michael Young, who I worked with on transportation engineering. So a lot of the things about traffic data, I learned from him, and that was a very interesting topic. And I also, I also should mention, I spent a lot of time in multiple different disciplines within civil engineering. So, such as project management, now transportation. On the right, we, I was with Mr. Tony Call, who did um, electrical and energy engineering. So focusing on maybe power plants, um, battery systems for power, um, stations and things of the sort. On the right was um, Mr. Josh Wilson, who was very nice to teach me some of the more basics about um, civil engineering and some of the, the project process that they go through to submit proposals and new plans to be um, confirmed by usually VDOT and a few other companies. Um, so he taught me things such as um, water quality and some of the design, like, again, the design process itself. Um, mo modeling AutoCAD was another big one. Um, he, he, taught, he showed me a lot of modeling software as well to tell me about such as traffic. They have certain modelings for trucks. They have ones for, uh, again, AutoCAD, which can actually design the entire building itself. And on the right is, I was in surveying and I met with um, Mr. Tyler Butterworth who taught me a fair, who was basically my main mentor in the surveying sector. He showed me a lot of the interesting equipment and the strategies they use to survey, such as LIDAR and drones such as this to do it. That is one of the largest drones they also use. Okay, um, moving on to my actual main mentor. So my overall mentor was probably, I would say, Mr. Jonathan Jackson. He is the like lead project director for Richmond's branch at, of Bowman. 
So he would, he's, he would see over the three main teams they had, which focused on residential, commercial, and industrial uh, projects. So he would focus on all of those and coordinate projects with the different companies, usually, that would do with them. On the right was Mr. Mike Latham. I spent a lot of time with him, especially on my first day, learning more about project management. He is one of the team leads. And um, I sat in with a few meetings. He showed me, he um, introduced me to the entire team. I learned a lot about, again, the project process. That's a very big thing there. Um, but I would also say overall, the actual entire Bowman teams were also in a way my mentor because they, again, took time out of their day to overall teach me about civil engineering and about the entire process and all the things about it. But why was it really important? Well, as I said before, I'm interested in civil engineering. I want to pursue it further in my life. So this was a great learning opportunity for myself specifically, just to learn more about civil engineering. So again, the process that goes into it, and I, and maybe the education that you would need. I also got a lot of information, such as you might want to be very well versed in AutoCAD, the, mo the modeling software. You want to, again, you want a degree. They recommended certain colleges that I might want to look into that may be quite well good for it. But at the same time, I also made very good connections in the civil engineering world. So while talking with Bowman, they were very nice and told me about a lot of different internship opportunities that they would be interested in seeing me pursue once I'm in college, because as I'm not 18 at the moment, I'm not allowed to do some of them. But in an engineering program, they were very interested in seeing me apply for some of them and maybe work alongside them on certain projects. But continuing on, my community service. So I worked along with Habitat for Humanity, which is a pretty widespread group along the US um, which provides housing for usually less fortunate individuals. Um, I worked specifically in our lo lo local branch here in Fluvanna. So um, specifically, I did some of their maybe smaller projects. So in every habitat home that is now cre is created, they ha give the homeowner a shed and um, equ they provide equipment for them for outdoor and like lawn care so type stuff. So I helped put together some of the brand new equipment they have that they just got for this brand new home that at the time, back in late last year, they were providing to a new recipient. So they would usually provide things such as maybe a lawnmower, a weed whacker, a wheelbarrow, things of that sort, maybe a shovel. Um, and at the same time, just in the same neighborhood, I also stained, cleaned and stained a porch for another Habitat Home recipient who's been living there for quite some time. So continuing, you can see on the right, which is kind of the first original image that I took of the porch. And on the left, you can see me originally pressure washing it because there was a lot of, there was a fair bit of cleaning that needed to be done to fix it up. After that was completed, I moved on to staining, starting with the railings. Over time, you can clearly see the difference in the color of the railings and just a lot of the work that maybe needed to be done. And you will see the finished project in just a moment, but I would also like to quickly thank my supervisor, Ms. Kelly O'Connor, who was the, at the time, brand new volunteer coordinator for Habitat for Humanity and for uh, Fluvanna. Um, she was incredibly kind and incredibly um, open to helping me schedule times that work for me and the homeowner to work in staining and creating and like building the equipment. She was always open to getting an email, and he asked, and asking questions, answer anything I needed. Um, just overall very helpful. She also was very kind in providing some of the equipment I used, some, such as the pressure washer and getting the stain. So I greatly thank her and her assistance in this part of the project. <laughs> but there are the finished product, projects right there. So you can see the entire porch being stained, all the equipment set up, and what was truly significant about it. Well, I was able to help a, a group and community in my local area, in, right here in Fluvanna, that has, in a way, a personal impact upon me. Um, I was able to help an individual who the homeowner would be, um, in her older age, would be unable to maybe stay in her entire porch like that, would probably have to hire someone, 
which is a very expensive and long process. I was able to just spend some afternoons after school, just whenever I could, just going over there and making some progress and just helping out whenever I could. Um, she was also very nice the entire way. She was incredibly kind, offered me anything I needed. If I needed some water that day, she was very nice. Um, at the same time, I also was able to tackle some of the smaller projects for Habitat for Humanity. So there's a lot of big things that may need to be done, but there's also smaller things, such as putting the equipment together, maybe helping with maintenance of prior houses. These are some projects that mainly require one person and may require some more consistent work over multiple days rather than just one single project, let's get it done in one day. Which there's less people that may have the time to do such a thing, because it requires a, a more consistent time commitment every day. Um, at the same time, I was also, due to COVID, teen volunteers were less of a common occurrence. So Mrs. O'Connor was able to use me as a maybe first step towards reintroducing teen volunteers for Habitat for Humanity in Fluvano. Um, it was, she was able to work with her, like the, her boss basically, the kind of coordinator for Fluvano for it, and use me as just a good, a good example of maybe we could start slowly reintroducing teens into volunteering. But enough with my project, what advice would I give to future students? Time management is a very big one. They're gonna hear, they, you, you might hear it a lot, but being cautious with your time and planning things out, it's very important because it's, there's a lot of work that needs to get done and it's like, here's all this stuff that needs to be done. Here's an end date. Figure out some, like get it all done by this time. You need to be careful and plan out your time very carefully. And at the same time for this project, just be thoughtful, thoughtful about you, what you wanna do. Take care in making sure it's something you want to do and it's something you're interested in. You have time to think about it and it can pretty much be whatever you want. As long as you like it and it may be important, I think that's really what matters. But for my future plans, as I mentioned before, I hope to head off to college and get a civil engineering degree. At the current time, I do have acceptance letters from Virginia Tech and Clemson, which are the two schools I'm mainly considering. Um, I hope to go there in the um, next year. So, any questions? <laughs> yes? I was just wondering if you could speak about the, uh, the different areas that you studied. Which did you find the most interesting? Graphics or schools? So, a few of the main ones I kind of looked in, I kind of worked with would be maybe structural, um, water systems, traffic and electrical and surveying. Those are, I feel like would be the five main ones that I kind of worked with. I feel like overall, um, I would be most interested in probably pursuing structural. I like the design of, design and creation of maybe buildings and bridges of that sort. I, I've always kind of liked design and not to be kind of cliche, but I liked playing with Legos as a kid, so. <laughs> I think you could definitely be an assistance. I feel like if it gets advanced enough, it could do the modeling work itself. I feel like it'd also be highly important in surveying. There's already, again, a lot of work with the robotics and a lot of drones. I feel like automation of that could be very powerful. But I feel like some of the planning and creatively working with the actual companies that you're providing a project for, it may require some more human interaction, at least for quite a little while until maybe AI becomes more advanced. They, like, what's your impression of their overall satisfaction of their I would say, depending on the place you go to, it may be a little different, but at Bowman it was a very calm and very open workspace. So although I did say there were three separate teams, a lot of the teams work all together, and they are very open to working on deadlines and helping each other out getting work done. So I feel like 
at least there, from my experience, I feel, I, I feel like it's a fairly calm and working, well working, people would come into the office, do work, and just be able to kind of leave over time. Like there was no, it didn't, I don't feel like it was ever too stressed ever there at any point. There were definitely, there's, I, I'm, I would be unsurprised if there were no moment, I'd be, sorry, I would be surprised if there were no moments of uh, maybe stress or panic in some of it. Because I did hear of t um, certain projects being sent in for review and then having to resend it five different times. But uh, most of the time, it, I feel like it was a fairly calm environment. And most people were pretty willing to help each other out and work together. Um, I, I, I did not personally go into that too much, but I do know of some projects at the time that, again, they have to go through review with so many different groups that I, I know there were some, I, I believe, it kind of seemed like some of the groups would be a lot more scrutinizing on the projects, depending on what they were doing, almost trying to not be a roadblock, but kind of be an inconvenience, because maybe they didn't like the idea of the project, but... I, didn't, I did not personally encounter a lot of it. Good morning, everyone. In 1841, Scottish essayist and historian Thomas Carlyle said that history is but the biography of great men. And while I agree with him that history is simply the stories of people in the past and the things that they've did, this quote leaves out an entire half of the population, a half of the population that I wanted to explore in my project. Local history, feminism in Fluvanna. I decided to pick this topic because I have been a history buff for as long as I can remember. From the time that I could read the plaques at the historical sites that my parents took me to, I have been interested in history and how it affects us today. In the last couple of years, I've been more interested in the history of minority communities, such as women, the LGBTQ plus community, or other marginalized sections of society. So, when it came to my Blue Ridge presentation, I decided that I was going to do my project on one of these communities in Fluvanna. I decided to pick femin uh, feminism specifically in Fluvanna. And that brings me to my research. I did my research on the question, how did women in Fluvanna and Central Virginia in the late 18th and early 19th centuries show independence and what movements of this time influenced them? I found that the women in Fluvanna and Central Virginia during this time showcased their independence and agency in a variety of ways. For some women, they showed their independence through smaller acts, such as teaching their children how to read and write and do math, or balancing the books to keep their family's budget prosperous. Other women showcased their independence, independence and agency in a much larger way through writing letters to the Virginia General Assembly and almost getting them to ban slavery, the closest that Virginia ever got to banning slavery, or managing their own plantations or running their own stores. 
I also found that these women, while they showcased their agency in a large variety of ways and had a huge impact on their local and broader community, were not inspired by a specific movement. In fact, during this time, there was no one specific feminist movement, such as the suffragette movement that we would think of in the early 1900s. Instead, if these women were influenced by anybody, they would have been influenced by Mary Wollstonecraft, a feminist enlightened thinker who was well known for her work, A Vindication on the Rights of Women, where she talked about what things she believed women could do that they were not allowed to do at that time. This brings me to my professional learning experience. I'll have to admit, my professional learning experience wasn't initially about feminism. When I started my professional learning experience, I thought I was going to be doing it on local history and its impact with the community. So, because of that, I decided to do it at the Louisa County Historical Society with my mentor, Caitlin Coughlin. Caitlin Coughlin is the director of the Louisa County Historical Society, as well as an archaeologist, which gives her an, an, an unique view into how history interacts with the local community. When I was with Caitlin, I did a variety of things, from helping out at a free family day, which is when the Historical Society is open to the public and people can come in and learn a little bit about Louisa history, to volunteering at their Juneteenth festival, to even shadowing Caitlin in the Historical Society. While I was shadowing, I learned about many of the things that a director of a historical society does, such as tracing genealogy requests, researching who owned lands before them, and sometimes doing things as simple as going through their collection, finding artifacts that, were belong, that belong to other historical societies, and sending them to them. Another thing I did, in fact, my favorite thing that I did, was I helped set up this exhibit. It is currently on display at the Louisa County Historical Society, if anybody wants to go see it, but it details the interaction of art in local artisans and local history. This was a collaboration between the Louisa County Historical Society and the Louisa Arts, Arts Council, in which they presented a, a variety of local artisans and local artists with local history artifacts and encouraged them to create pieces of art with them. I, helped, I got to help set up the exhibit that showcases these to the public, something that I greatly enjoyed because I loved seeing a direct relationship between local history and how it interacts with the public. As I said earlier, I didn't start my, my professional learning experience didn't counter feminism. In fact, I didn't even think about adding feminism to local history until I started my community service. I did my community service with Trisha Johnson, who's the director at the Fluvanna County Historical Society. And I initially did this because I wanted to be able to do my community service at a place that was very close to home. And luckily for me, when I reached out to Trisha, she said that she would love to have a high school intern with them. And in fact, they had a project that they were interested in having me help with. This project was the reading and cataloging of letters written by or to women at the Brema Bluff plantations, three plantations on the James River in Fluvanna County. So for my community service, I sat down with Tricia and we read through f uh, dozens and dozens of these letters as, and then we uh, cataloged them in an online database. Soon this online database will be available to everybody who is interested in local history, as well as people across the world who are interested in learning more about feminist history and what women were doing between the decades of 1800 and 1870. This was very interesting because I got to learn firsthand about what women during this time experienced. Sure, some of the letters talked about gossip and going to visit the hot springs and who in their family was sick, but other letters talked about politics. I remember there was one specific letter that talked about that lamented Andrew Jackson as president, which I thought was hilarious because these are women that we didn't, we don't think of women as this time into having an opinion in politics, but these letters show that they did. And those letters influenced me to do my research on feminism, specifically in Fluvanna, and how these women impacted, how these women's lives impacted their community and a broader community. During my community service, I also did a lot of discussions about other local histories and other women in Fluvanna who did things that were outside of the norm for their time. And that taught me a lot about myself, including the fact that I love local history. I've decided that wherever I choose to go to college, wherever I end up after college, I'm always going to be interested in local history and make it a point to visit my local historical society and see what new things these people and wherever I live have learned about women and minorities in their area. 
of course, I had a few challenges during this project, because everybody does. Originally, I didn't think I was going to be doing it on local history. I thought I was going to be doing it on local historical architecture. However, when I reached out to my mentors to see if they would be uh, amenable to me coming and having a summer research, summer internship with them, they never responded to me. Which brings me to my advice for Uprising Seniors, as well as any, anybody else in Blue Ridge. My advice is that time management is a lifesaver. And I know it's been said before, and it will probably be said many, many times during the course of these presentations. But it's true, because you don't know what's going to happen during this presentation. It's a long time. It's months and months of work, and it's months of work that are also when you're busy applying for colleges, or studying for the SAT, or taking your hard senior year courses. So being able to understand what method of time management works for you and allows you to complete this project successfully, as well as get into those schools that you're trying to get into, that will make everything so much easier and so much less stressful. For my future, I am looking at a few different colleges. Currently, I'm looking at either Allegheny College in Pennsylvania or Hofstra University in New York City. While I'm at college, I plan to study either public humanities or art history in the hopes of becoming an architect, a his, a conservation architect or art conservator, conservator. After I graduate college, I plan to get my master's in historical preservation so that I can conserve art, architecture, and anything else with local history for years to come. Any questions? Honestly, probably that, because I had heard from my mentor that they talked about politics, but I really wasn't expecting to open up a letter from 1830 and hear women complaining about the president, because you just don't think of that happening. Not as much. Um, I don't think there were, these families were all over the place. So they had, while the letters were written by people at Brimo, they were talking to people in Northern Virginia, in Southern Virginia, in Richmond. So there's really a large variety of people. And I have, because they're women, I have, we're not quite sure who they may have married, who their children may have married. So even if their families have a large impact in Fluvanna today, it would be extremely hard to trace the genealogy back and determine exactly who they're related to. Yes. Uh, so I would say about 99.9% .9 of these letters are written by women. There are, these letters are from the collection of, uh, Ta of John, uh, John Hartwell Cock, who is the, the, he was the owner of Brimo Plantations, he was the designer of the Fluvanna County Courthouse, and he was also a contemporary of Thomas Jefferson. Since he was a contemporary of Thomas Jefferson, his collection of letters are at the University of Virginia. So we have all the letters written by or to his wife, wife's sister, etc. As such, there may be one or two letters from his son, Charles Carey Cock, to his wife, uh, Lucy Oliver Cock, but the vast, vast majority of these are written by women. Any more questions? Thank you.
John Turner Ray. Uh, I did not spend a lot of time with her this year, but I, she has a topic that I needed this morning. Uh, stress management and educators. I encourage John. Uh, and she's going to come present that to you. So let's welcome her. Good morning. My name is Brenna Ray, and I did my senior capstone project on stress management and educators. My reasoning behind this project comes from my passion of helping others and really helping them be the best people they can be. And along this journey, I really discovered my love for teaching and really helping students such as at elementary age, helping them be the better person they can be and developing them into good humans. So a little bit about me, my name is Brenna Ray. I am a senior here at Flavana County High School. I participate in the volleyball and swimming programs. And outside of school, I am a volunteer firefighter EMT at Lake Monticello Fire Department. And this really helped me develop a sense of community service and volunteerism at a young age as I really love just being able to help others and give back to my community. My parents can note this especially from a young age, I was never gonna be a professional golfer, so I really had to figure something out quick. <laughs> so in the fall of 2023, I conducted my internship where I spent 40 hours and 15 minutes spent at different levels of the educational system throughout many classes, K through 12, where I spent time in classrooms with teachers really learning what it's like to be a teacher. And these 40 hours I spent outside of my teacher cadet internship of 30 hours. My head mentor during this project was Mr. Mitchell Pace, a veteran teacher here at Flavana County High School and a head instructor for the teacher cadet program. Mr. Pace was able to connect me to varying instructors of differing like education levels, really being able to show me the different levels of education, such as elementary, kindergarten, all the way up to 10th, 11th, and 12th grade. And over the next few slides, I actually get to share with you some of the like, tasks and lessons I got to actually help with. So this is actually a picture of me with one of my big first projects I actually did during my internship, where I actually got to engage in Miss Christy Marshall and Pam Bingler's kindergarten class. They are phenomenal teachers who really take pride in engaging with their students, not just in the standard of learning curriculum, but showing them that learning can be fun. And then this project, it was around Thanksgiving time. We really worked to help these students get a hands-on and almost historical appeal to artifacts. So we helped them make native drums. While this may look cute and simple, it was actually a lot more stressful than I could have imagined, with students wanting to bang on the drums 24-7, or even just trying to draw it and get it paced on. It really turned into a real hassle. And I will say, after this picture, it may look calm here, but it got very loud, and oh, a drum broke, but not to toot my own horn, I did fix that drum and save the day. <laughs> so in my next picture was the actual first lesson I got to teach at the elementary level. This lesson consisted of me teaching about counting and how we circle and group items together, along with having to pull these items into the, their respective categories. This was around Christmas time. So we were circling our Christmas item as we are here pointing and counting together the reefs. So that way we can compare and contrast how many of each Christmas item we had. And doing so, this lesson took around three hours for me to plan, which is a lot more than I imagined because I had to fit it into the classroom's expectations and the standard of learning for that week and what the students needed to really work on in the classroom. And this next picture, I have to say, was one of my favorite activities I got to do with my students. This resulted in me actually getting to help carve open a pumpkin, and we actually got to see, the students got to actually get hands on and see the development of a pumpkin and what really was going on inside. There were a numerous amounts of, ooh, this is yuck, or ooh, let me, I wanna do it again. But for the most part, it was really cool to see students like reach in and be able to pull out the guts and seeds of a pumpkin and really get to know, like, how does this work? And not just a worksheet or doing a craft on a piece of paper, they got to have a hands-on experience with the material and really learn. And then my fourth and final slide for my internship really showed me something that I was not expecting during this internship. I really, teachers do not get enough appreciation, as I know, 
And I can say I'm surprised I don't have a few gray hairs from just interning with these teachers. So I have incredible respect for all teachers. But during this internship, I expected no recognition from these students. I just was kind of just there to help them and really help the teachers just organize clean. But these students actually made me a sign saying how appreciative they were. I was just taking that one-on-one -on -one time with them that they may have been in whole group and really working with them as an individual, not just a part of a whole class. So just seeing the stresses in the classroom, which I can say are not for the faint of heart, especially at the elementary level, really showed me that teachers need all the resources they can get. And this led me to my community service project, where I spent 18 hours and 30 minutes dedicated to helping teachers anonymously through a sign-up sheet get a teacher's aid for a few blocks. This could be either just to help clean, organize, or just help cover their class, just so that way they could have time to plan or just work through their material that they had to plan for, next, say, next week. And I conducted this community service alongside my head mentor, Ms. Caitlin harlow Burner. She is the head mental health resource coordinator here at Savannah County Public Schools. She works one-on-one -on -one with teachers and administrators to help meet with them and really work with them on any mental struggles or issues in their profession that may arise. And we work together to create this sign-up sheet and see what would be the most beneficial resources we could provide for teachers in their classrooms. And we decided on this sign-up sheet. So over the next few slides, I could show you one of the big activities I got to do other than cleaning and organizing classrooms, which that's not as fun to show, but <laughs> I actually got to do another elementary lesson where I got grabbed randomly by an elementary teacher because they needed an extra hand. And I actually got to lead a small polling lesson while the teacher just needed a few extra minutes to plan. So I conducted this graph around February of this year and I spent this time really just working with students to know that their opinion matters and that they shouldn't be biased about whether, say, their classmates decided, yes, let's say the groundhog, we get more winter or more snow, but they had an opinion and they didn't need to be forced to feel that way. So during this time, I actually got to help students decide their decisions and actually put them up on the graph. And Hidden behind the scenes of these pictures, the teachers actually had a few extra minutes just to let their classrooms get reorganized and for them to actually plan. And here is actually another picture of me helping a student who was having a little bit of trouble placing her vote on the board. And I really worked with her to help her understand her vote and what she was actually say, meaning when she placed her vote. So after seeing all the stresses in the classroom, I 100% learned how entirely stressful teaching can be at any level. And like I said, I give great respect to the teachers in this school or any level because it's tough. I'm not going to lie. I expected it to be a lot more easier going into it. And I truly think teachers need a lot more resources that, than that are being provided. So my research topic really can instructed myself into what are some of the main issues presenting to teachers that are causing these stress levels to be like rising in schools. And this really made me look at the idea of how can we better support them? What resources are available and necessary for teachers to lower the teacher, leave, teachers leaving the profession while also guaranteeing the academic su success of students? And I found three large issues presenting themselves in my research such as the COVID-19 pandemic. The COVID-19 pandemic took place in 2020, and this was a one-year shutdown of the educational system as we know it. This required students, to be, students and teachers alike to have to adapt to a new system of learning online, not face-to-face, -face, not being able to work on their behaviors or really interact with each other face-to-face. -face. Teachers had to adapt to a brand new educational system that was never done before unless you were an online school or a smaller private school. And this itself really showed in the classroom, even to this day, and many of you may be asking, how is this relevant to Vivana? I can say just from my short time in my internship, it seems, I have seen numerous behavioral and social interaction issues that are still present to this day. My next main focus of my research came from the security and safety of schools. As many know, the United States is one of the leading, leading countries of mass shootings across the, across the globe. And doing so, 
mass shootings in schools are highly prevalent across the United States. And knowing so, a teacher's job is to teach their students and to help them become a better person. Instead, teachers are more worried about the security and safety of their students and what it actually is going to mean at the end of the day if they can send their students home to their parents or they can make it home to their families. Teachers have enough stress on their plate just planning lessons, getting the grade books graded. Why should security and safety be one of those issues? And my third and final topic of my research came from administrative pressure. As we all know, in Fluviana County and across the state of Virginia, we start SOL testing in third grade. This is a standardized learning curriculum which places requirements on teachers for a set curriculum of what students must learn. And it gauges the teacher's ability to teach these concepts and students' abilities to grasp them. These SOLs are an essential portion of administrative pressure which teachers feel that they must conform to the SOL standards and of getting the work done, just getting the students to grasp the material instead of truly knowing it. And even here in Savannah County Public Schools, especially in Central Elementary Kindergarten classes, there is actually a standard of learning program called Engage. Engage is a literacy, mathematic, and reading comprehension, comprehension series of standard of learning, which requires students to know such as items such as adding, subtraction, addition, just to know, just polling and trying to figure out what is going on. In kindergarten, I can barely remember knowing how to do a craft and put a craft together. And these students are required to do many worksheets a day, whereas I know many of us can remember doing smaller crafts in kindergarten. Those days are gone. And I will say, Miss Christy Marshall during my internship did a phenomenal job of trying to make the classroom fun again. And throughout my research, I really discovered that teachers need all the resources they can get through mental, through mental health resources just to helping them in their classrooms getting their assistance. And my advice to future BRVGS seniors is make sure you have a class block for this class. This, cl this class is tough, I'm not going to lie. I did not have a class block for it, and I know I went many times to Miss Esch crying because I did not know what to do. And yeah, just make sure you have a class block or a set period of time and time management. And next year, I will be attending Hollins University to major in elementary education while continuing my swimming and volleyball career. And are there any questions? Yes, Ms. Aiken. Um, have you heard about, I was just wondering if you had any information, which was the big event um, last night, actually, that was in the news. So, um, I just wondered if you had any interaction with that particular, I've never heard of that event last night. I've heard it's been all over the, the district, not just Savannah, but Albemarle neighboring got together and had a steak dinner and, you know, listened to music and all of that, and I just wondered if you knew anything about um, the impetus for that or who started that. Or I actually do not know, and I will have to say that is actually a great idea, which is just getting everybody together, but I primarily took a focus on actually getting teacher in the classroom, just being able to let them have a little more time, but that is a great idea, and if I were to expand, I would try and coordinate an event on that in my project. Final? Uh, so you spoke about virtual learning and that being a big thing in the Fred Aiken. Mm -hmm. uh, so a lot of the federal government agencies that end up taking classes, uh, the federal government and some other agencies' classes in virtual learning, that ends up affecting how parents and teachers are able to get their kids in. Yeah, I, that's a great question, and I would definitely say that. As I've witnessed in my internship, students particularly do much better unless there are outside circumstances where they do much better with their studies in person where teachers can really gauge their level of interaction and how well they are doing in their projects or assignments or anything. Yes? So you mentioned you planned a lesson for three hours. Yes. 
that lesson actually lasted 45 minutes. It took a little bit longer and it took a lot of crowd control, I'm not gonna lie, but I really had to focus on making sure that uh, the students weren't like trying to jump on the table or anything crazy. I would recommend the teachers just to really take use of like any kind of therapeutical resources that are offered. And also, I came across an actual study which suggested actually journaling, just to let out their emotions for the day and really kind of focus on the idea of just letting out the day of what happened and just being able to take a deep breath and let the day go and we'll move on to another day. Any other questions? Somewhere between 12 and 13 minutes. That's what I want to hear. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Weirdly, Kessler, you were the only one that came in under a little bit. But, absolutely, it, it was fine. It was absolutely fine. This is just more condensed. Oh, your presentation was great. But you've had a lot of practice with this. I think I was, I practiced, when I did it in Campbell's yesterday, I was like eight. You're somewhere in between, yeah. That's spot on. Plus, then you got a few questions, so that puts you over. So you're good. Good morning, everybody. My name is Chloe Brown, and I did my BRVGS senior capstone project on exploring the real estate business. A little bit about myself is I'm a senior here at FCHS, and I'm also a part of the Beta Club. 
The reason why I'm interested in real estate is mainly because I'd like to explore it as a career path, and it's also something that me and my grandmother could bond over as she is very interested in home improvement, and she does most of it DIY, but we like to talk about it and bond over it, and so it's something that means a lot to me. My topic for research was the relationship between the economy and real estate, but my research question focused more specifically on the question of what are some possible solutions to the housing affordability crisis. I chose this topic because it seems to be a very up and coming issue and it becomes a bigger issue every day. These are some of the most influential resources that I printed and annotated for my research paper. They taught me a lot, um, vocabulary and other methods and also the relationship between the economy and real estate, a lot of things that you wouldn't think about. The solutions that I did find most helpful was a local government policy called rent control. It is a very controversial topic for some communities, but basically it's when a committee or town council gets together and they sent a cap on rent control, on rent for units, for specific units, so that these renters don't get displaced from their homes. Um, lots of people think that if someone's not able to afford the unit, then they shouldn't be living there, but sometimes there are unfortunate things, uh, such as property managers or the owners of the rental unit just saying, hey, everybody else is doing it, I'm gonna do it too, and then unfortunately these people ha no longer have a place to live. The next solution that I found was helpful for the real estate market is subsidies and grants. These two focus mainly on residential development. Subsidies, it's, it can be a tax break or it can be a direct payment such as cash, which helps lower the cost of labor materials, um, permits that they may need to start building. And it allows for the break in the building to give a break in the final cost of a home or a unit. These grants are also similar, except they're a lot more competitive because you have to write resource, uh, you have to write essays for them, you're competing with other companies, and you also don't have to pay them back, so they are very highly sought after. The final solution that I found to be most helpful was public-private partnerships, or P3s for short. These partnerships um, allow for the public sector to have the funding and the private sector to have the innovative technology so that these residential properties can be built efficiently. And for my professional learning experience, I interned at Long and Foster Lake Monticello with Ms. Jen Sample. She has been a real estate agent for over 18 years and she has two bachelor's degree from Virginia Tech. And she's also from, uh, she also went to Mosley Real Estate Schools, which is local to Richmond and they also have online. These are some of the notes that I would take after a session. I would write down notes, questions, anything that went on during our sessions together, and then I would compile them into more organized notes so that I could review the information that I learned, see if there was anything else I needed further clarification on. And then on the other side, that's me putting up an under contract sign for one of the houses that she was currently trying to sell for one of her clients. This is an Instagram advertisement that I had made for Ms. Sample during one of our uh, sessions because real estate agents have to do their own personal advertising to their community to get their name out. So these are some of the houses that she had sold for some of her clients and they also have their um, over asking price listed. What did I learn from my community service? I mean, my internship? I learned quite a bit, but one of the most important things that I learned is what it meant to be a real estate agent. These real estate agents most often are portrayed as money grabbing and only doing it to sell a house or get a check, but it's a lot more emotionally connected than that. These clients sometimes aren't making the most happiest decisions in their lives and they need to downsize because they might have had a family member pass away or they wanna move closer to a family that's sick. So it's not always a joyous occasion for most. Um, which we would always like it to be, but it's not. So it's really important to have an emotional connection with your clients and to never push them to make a decision that they're not comfortable with. Another thing that I learned that is very helpful that I wasn't very
very aware of before I started my internship is that these real estate agents go into houses, empty houses most of the time, where they're not very sure of the layout, um, but they need to become familiar with their exits as they are showing these houses to clients that they are not very comfortable with, or I shouldn't say that, but they're more likely to not know everything about their clients, so you're not sure if this is a dangerous person or what their true intentions are when you're alone with them in a house, so you just let your know, you let your agents know, like, hey, this is where I'm going, this is who I'm gonna be with. I'm not sure when I'll be back, but this is what I'm doing. The next thing that I learned is how to earn and maintain a real estate license. The average person takes about six to eight months to earn their license, but it can take shorter or longer depending on your work pace and your schedule, of course. And then also as of now, you do have to renew your license every two years uh, with an exam and you can just go back to the same school and most of the time the exam is open book. The next thing that I learned is what goes into the pricing of a home. A lot of people just say what it looks like on the inside of the aesthetics or the remodeling, but it's also the longevity of where the roof is, the siding, if there's any electrical problems. There's a lot of factors that go into how, uh, how you price a home. So it's very important to know these things, especially when you are trying to sell a house for a client, you need to make that base price and so people have uh, space to work with the price. The digital and physical resources for agents is also something that I found very interesting. There are a lot of resources that not a lot of people know of and some of them are even public, such as tax records, property records, permits, anything like that. The county would have all of those so they are publicly uh, accessible. But some of the digital resources for agents are uh, payment memberships, such as the multi-listing systems that a lot of agents use. They go in and they research these properties to see how long the HVAC system has been in the house or if it was recent, really, uh, recently replaced, if there's anything new, new appliances. You can find a lot of information on these properties um, if they have any uh, outdoor issues or what kind of plot they're on. The lifespan of home systems is also something that I found to be interesting that I learned. I feel like it's not talked about a lot, but a lot of people need to know like when their HVAC needs to be checked out or if they need a new one. The electrical systems, how long those should last and how long they can last if you take um, good care of them. And also the upkeep of a regular home, such as when you need to replace your roof or replace the siding. For my community service, I did a donation drive for the Shelter for Help in Emergency. They are a domestic violence shelter located in uh, Charlottesville, Virginia. They take in women and children. This was my contact at the shelter, Miss Alex. She was very helpful if I had any questions and she clarified a lot of information for me. And she was also very kind and very helpful. She was very, yeah, she's very, I'm trying to find the word, but. I did my donation drive at the um, new Papa Jim's location with my, uh, this is a digital poster that I made to the left. I made it and then I dispersed it on Facebook uh, at the beginning of the week before the shelter. This is just telling people what, when, who, where, and why. And then on the right is a voucher that Papa Jim's was kind enough to make for me that gave people the motivation to come in and donate for such a great cause. My community service mentor was Ms. Tabitha Green, and I picked her because I felt that she understood the severity and the importance of this type of donation drive, as a lot of these people are sometimes, like they remove themselves or they're physically removed, they're not in a safe space, which your home is supposed to be and they have to go and seek help somewhere else. And so I, under I thought that she was very understanding of that because her husband is actually the SRO, Joshua Green, here at the Fluvanna County High School. And he has worked with some in some instances. So she understands how important it is to have these resources. These are some of the donations that I did donate. We raised over 113 pounds in donations for the shelter and also a little bit under $100 in cash as sometimes they ask for gas money. My advice to future seniors is that do what works for you. If you have to take an extra step or you have to do extra prep work and it seems unnecessary, but it could also help you, 
If it seems unnecessary to somebody else but it's helpful to you, I definitely recommend that you should do it no matter what anybody else thinks as I did a lot of prep work and it may have been a little bit of extra time taken out but it made my research process smoother when I did print out and annotate my research sources as I felt that I understood the material a lot better. My future plans is that I'm going to finish up my associate's degree at PVCC and then I have not decided whether or not I'm going to get my real estate license right out of college or if I'm going to become some kind of assistant to a real estate agent so I can earn more job experience as I'm not yet comfortable with becoming a real estate agent right after college. Are there any questions? Yes, yeah, so when you are a real estate agent, the market fluctuates a lot, so you're always trying to pay attention and plan financially for yourself and your family. So a lot of the real estate agents, when they don't have that, um, that foundation with their community just yet, they do have a second job to just bring in some extra cash for the, six, um, for the first six to months to a year in order to financially support themselves while they're uh, getting a sphere of influence. But also, they do have to plan and save and work really hard in, in order to make sure that they do have the funds when the market does go bad. If the market goes bad, they're generally not as busy, but that also means that they can have the time to pick up a second job if need be, because a lot of real estate agents and, um, eventually have a second job. favorite story would most likely be from my internship. Miss Sample is a really kind lady, so anytime that we were together, we were always having fun and always laughing, even like we were still getting work done, but it was a lot of fun. She told me this one time, why she always keeps an extra pair of shoes in her car is because her client didn't let her know where the dog went to the bathroom, and so one time she did step in dog feces and so she always carries an extra pair of shoes and a grocery bag to put those nasty shoes in. <laughs> yes? So, so you talked about unexpected employment and the economy disrupting. What was the most unexpected employment you ever had? I would say that the most unexpected correlation would be gas prices. I didn't talk about it too much in this presentation, but I did talk about it in a little bit in my research paper. Gas prices affect how much it would cost to move the building materials. So you have the building material cost and then you have the transportation cost. And with the increase in gas prices, it just makes everything that much more expensive. You're welcome. Yes. So there was a conversation between me and my mentor, Ms. Sample. She did say that sometimes if you do need help picking out a base price for one of your clients, you can always go on one of those types of websites. And Zillow is very popular among real estate agents, but you always take it with a grain of salt because sometimes they do overprice or underprice them. Are there any more questions? I'm so sorry, it is so very sorry. Uh, before we go further, I want to uh, thank our judges. Uh, this is from the
time out of their day today to sit through all these presentations and uh, you know help us out here. Megan, Mr. Gibson. Okay, next we have a young man who's going to talk about as you see here, aerospace and climate change. I can't wait for this. All right, Dave Helpson, come on up. So today I'll be talking about my senior capstone project, aerospace engineering and climate change. Starting with me. I am Gabriel Halverson. I'm a student here at Bluvana, and I've been in the Blue Ridge program for around four years now. And I have always been passionate about engineering, but my specific focus on aerospace uh, stems from my grandmother and my stepfather. My grandmother works at, worked at a mirror lab in Arizona, and I remember vividly taking tours of that mirror lab. It was amazing. I just loved it. Um, my stepfather works at Northrop Grumman, which is a very prominent uh, aerospace engineering firm. So I wanted to look more into aerospace engineering and I wanted to pursue it. For my research, I focused on um, aerospace engineering and how it can, uh, how the industry can adapt to the demands for climate change through technology. And I came to three conclusions. I came to the conclusion that sustainable aviation fuel, uh, hydrogen and electric, hydrogen powered, uh, hydrogen powered aviation and electric powered aviation would all be viable for the future of aviation. Uh, sustainable aviation fuel is a type of fuel where they pretty much mix in uh, non-fossil fuel elements to it, which makes it the effect of the carbon that when it burns less impactful. It's important for the aerospace in particular for climate change because uh, it's all in the atmosphere. This makes it far more impactful than like your average car or anything else like that. The issue with SAF is unfortunately that it's not being produced as much as regular fuel, and there's not much of an incentive to uh, transfer to it. Hydrogen-powered, like uh, <laughs> hydrogen-powered aircraft, they are less. Well, it's not really viable right now, but in the future, it showed a lot of promise, and that's why I included hydrogen-powered aviation, electric power aviation is all just my professional learning experience was at Orange County Airport where I was shown what happens at a general aviation airport by Paul Weber who is who was very um, understanding of my situation and it was very accommodating for me and he showed me uh, what happens at his airport. He showed me uh, all the uh, like the devices that he uses at the airport to do stuff, and he showed me the infrastructure at the infrastructure at the airport. That is some pictures of the some of the tools that they use. Those are some pictures of the tools that they use. And this is another part of my internship where he pretty much assigned me a ton of the uh, ACE modules, which the ACE is Airport Certified Employee. It, I read through them and it's pretty much all just like manuals for regulations and procedures that you have to follow when you're managing an airport. My community service was with um, was at <laughs> Carysburg Elementary School. I presented to a class of fourth graders, Miss Lori Hall's class. Miss Hall was very understanding. She was very accommodating. She 
helped me a lot. Uh, this is a picture of me at the at in the classroom presenting, and it's there's some pictures of my presentation. It was a lot of it was like just creating the presentation itself because it I had to research like what these students need and like their level of understanding and I had to lower it down to their level of understanding. Another part of it was that I created a website for them so that they could create their own airplane, like paper airplane for a challenge. And here's a picture of me helping one of the students create the paper airplane. My advice is to start early and not to procrastinate. And my future plans is to hopefully go to Virginia Tech and maybe the University of Virginia. One big thing that I learned about myself is that I didn't actually mind working with the kids so much. It was a lot better than I expected. Surprisingly not. They were actually very attentive. Yes? Um, you just said that you saw in these pictures that the students were taking first and the students were helping with that. Absolutely. They, that was the part where they focused a lot. They, all of them, like I had to uh, actually, I pulled up extra uh, designs that I didn't outline in my website for them because they were all interested in it. Yes, Derek? I'm not too sure, actually. Uh, I don't think it will have much of an effect. It's not really that important to this field of aerospace engineering. But uh, another thing I would like to say is that the kids, I think, they took a lot from it. They, they learned more from it than I, I hope they learned from it, at least. And I hope that they at least had a fun time. Absolutely. Uh, the commercial industry, it's going to be harder to convert them, but the private planes, they can, uh, they actually don't have much of an impact. The main issue is usually the transport sector with like cargo and that kind of stuff, transporting goods. That's where a lot of aviation produces its CO2 and the like. Yeah. Not anytime soon. What I came like uh, sustainable aviation fuel is like going to be the closest to what we can do now. But hydrogen fuel is a little bit out there, mainly because hydrogen fuel aircraft they require a complete retro retrofit of like the entire design for aircrafts. So, yes. There's not much of a difference, really. It's negligible. <laughs> I just wondered if, um, if you did any research that related to like NASA and launching
No, I've really focused on uh, the current aviation se sector, especially commercial aircrafts. Yeah. Good morning, my name is Alexis Perry and I completed my BRVGS capstone project on family medicine and its neglect. A little bit about me, I've always been interested in medicine since I was young, so I knew I wanted to focus this project on something medically related. But I was unaware, as I'm currently indecisive on where I, what I want to pursue, so I looked into something I knew less about, which was primary care. And from there I found family medicine, which provides the first round of preventative measures through annual checkups, and it allows diseases and illnesses to be discovered before it progresses further. This led me to my research question of, why is family medicine less popular than other fields, and what can combat this disinterest? So through my research, I have found three factors that I wanted to focus on, the first one being pay. Many medical students accrue a lot of debt throughout their course of going through medical school. And so they want to find a specialty where they can earn a lot of money. And family medicine is known for not making nearly as much as other specialties, so many students choose to pursue a different route. The next factor was perception. Once again, because of the pay, many people hold more pejorative views of family medicine, and they don't view it as prestigious as other specialties are. They tend to focus on the amount of knowledge specialties have on their one skill, such as on the heart for cardiovascular doctors, rather than acknowledging that family medicine doctors have a lot of knowledge on all ages, all demographics, and they have to continue learning throughout their entire career. Finally, I focused on exposure. Now, family medicine is not something usually discussed when you're in a medical school or even during your undergraduate years, which causes many people to not learn about the benefits and how you can truly help different underserved communities and demographics. So how do we change these three factors? How do we gain more interest in family medicine? Well, I looked into pay, but raising pay is not as feasible as it may seem. You can't easily allocate more money to the specialty. So I focused on measures such as loan repayment pro programs, which they allow payment for medical school in place of working in a location for a certain amount of time. Let's say you work in a rural community for a year or two. You can then receive compensation for that work for that exactly one or two years you work there, or sometimes people have to work longer to receive full compensation for their entire medical school career. And for exposure, I looked into earlier exposure for students so they can understand the benefits and why being a family medicine doctor can help. A major factor of this is rural communities. Rural communities such as Fluvanna face the most face the greatest shortage in family medicine, and 66% of the healthcare workforce shortage is prevalent in rural communities. So finding those underserved communities, rural communities, and economically disadvantaged students can help more people look into family medicine. And finding that specific demographic who can be interested and in providing the funds through loan repayment programs can help foster and decrease the shortage in healthcare workers. For my internship, 
I went to the UVA Primary Care Center and my mentor was Dr. John Gazewood. He is the residency director and he has his MD in family medicine. He provided me with a lot of the foundational knowledge that I used in my research paper and he provided a lot of useful information on how I can pursue this career and my future in general and going into medical school. Now, some of the best parts of this internship was being able to see how he interacted with patients. He has a wonderful patient-provider connection with all of his patients, and you could see the importance of having a family medicine doctor. You can go to someone who you build trust with and develop a, a good enough trust so they can provide you the best care possible. I was also able to meet residents and people who are in their gap year before going into medical school. And one of them was Dr. Echo Buffalo. She is currently in her second year of residency and she is from North Carolina. So she was able to tell me why she came up to Virginia, what interested her about family medicine and all of her motivations for the field. And I was also able to see a few, a few procedures such as an assessment for BPPV, which stands for benign paroxysmal peripheral vertigo, which is fancy jargon for feeling dizziness and extreme dizziness when you stand and move around. And seeing that was really interesting because that is not anything I would ever conceive would be the issue with a patient when they come in with dizziness. I learned about a lot of different diseases and ailments and different treatments for those ailments while being there. And since I was unable to take pictures with patients due to HIPAA violations, um, I took a lot of pictures of the equipment instead. So on the left is a, trans a portable translation machine, which if a patient isn't proficient in English, we can take this machine into the room with us, get on a call, and we can get in contact with the translator. And on the right is a portable blood pressure machine, which the nurses use in their checkups before Dr. Gaze will enter. On the right is me and Dr. Gazewood when I finally mustered up the courage to ask for a photo. And on the left is one of the computers present in all the rooms. These computers can be used to pull up their chart history, so like their medical background and anything the doctor should know about them, as well as be used to, to print out all the necessary paperwork for the patient. So for my community service, I went to the UVA NICU and I helped out there and I was under two CNAs, Kaylin on the left and Destiny on the right. A CNA is a certified nursing assistant and they all work to help out wherever they're asked for. The registered nurses who have the babies and are taking primary care can ask the CNAs to come help or take some of their responsibilities away. Under them, on the left, on the, on the left is me in front of the sign, the NICU sign, and on the right is one of the kits I made. So the first thing I did each night was I went and checked all the materials and I checked these kits as well. These kits can be used to make certain tasks easier. And for example, this is a PIV kit. Peripheral IV kits can be taken into delivery rooms and used as a starter IV for newborns if it's necessary. So I made a variety of kits and it allo allows all the professionals to be able to have the required materials to start necessary procedures. Now on the left and right are just pictures of the units where the babies would remain. And on the right is just a unit where a baby was present. We have the incubator there, the machines running and on. Now this was my favorite part of my community service and I was being able to provide care for the babies. I was able to feed them, burp them, change them, and provide cares which include changing them, taking their weight, taking their blood pressure and all those items. On the left is a bottle I used and on the right displays the different nipple sizes for the bottles as a preemie baby grows to full term. All the way to the left is the slowest flow of milk. So a preemie baby who is born the earliest can first take milk in at a good speed for them. And they as they come to term, they should all build up all the way to the right and be able to take milk at a faster speed. So on the left is a radiant warmer. This is used for newborn babies to keep their temperature optimal as nurses provide cares to them. And on the right is an incubator, which is also used to keep the newborn's temperature optimal, but this is where they reside while they're in the unit. So the significance of my community service was essentially 
being able to alleviate some of the tasks of the registered nurses. Most nurses have three to four babies, but on less busy days they can have two. But all in all, being able to take over their cares for them allows them to focus on other patients when necessary. And if a machine goes off, they can go to that baby that needs help and the CNAs and I could take over and help. So what did I learn? I learned that I'm actually quite interested in family medicine because I went into this project expecting to just learn a little more about family medicine, increase my knowledge on the medical field in general instead of choosing to pursue it in the future. But I learned that I may actually want to pursue family medicine as a career. My advice for rising seniors would be first, to remain diligent. This project requires an insane amount of work, so you have to be steadfast in your motivation with your topic, and you have to be proactive. You cannot allow yourself to procrastinate to an extreme degree or to an, an amount that prevents you from completing your work on time. If you plan ahead and you work diligently, you will be able to complete this project just fine. My second point would be to show some leniency you will most likely face some adversities while you are working on this project. Me personally, I had to get in contact with three to four people before I actually secured an internship. So I allowed myself some leniency and continued searching for a possible mentor, and I eventually found one in Dr. Gazewood. So my future plans, I have all these schools up here, but quite frankly, I do not know where I'm going. I also applied regular decisions, so I'm still waiting to hear back from some of the colleges I applied to. Are there any questions? I was just wondering if, um, if your family care physician um, had any kind of insight on the stress that the I mean, since I was at UVA, there were there's pretty much enough workers, but I'm sure in other areas there's less workers for the doctors, such as like nurses. But also, the stress come, can come from having to learn about new topics arising in every category. You have to know about child care to elderly care, so you have to remain updated on all those facts. So that can be a point of stress for family doctors. I didn't talk about it extensively, but I do think that would impact how many people want to go into family medicine. But somewhat, yes. Oh, definitely. There's definitely a lack. You know, AI can contribute, and while I didn't look into it for family medicine, I do know it's already being implemented in other aspects. For example, in cardiovascular health, AI is currently being used to help improve screenings, and it can search for diseases that aren't necessarily noticeable through other methods. In the examples like left ventricular dysfunction, the AI screening can be used to help identify that issue.
All right, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Noah Jones, and my research question is how sports affect the mental health of a Division I athlete. In the spring of 2022, two Division I athletes committed suicide, and after hearing about this, along with other athletes who have been struggling for mental health issues, it made me want to pursue a career in sports psychology and ultimately led me to decide this is my topic. Look too far. So a little bit about me, I've played sports my entire life. I've played soccer, basketball, football, golf. Uh, the last seven years I've been playing soccer. The last three I have started on varsity and this year I'm varsity captain. Division one is the hardest level of competition in the NCAA. Athletes train all their lives to compete at the Division I level and possibly pursue a professional career. For my research paper, I wrote about uh, common things that put athletes under stress. These four things were pressure to perform, balancing academics, performance-related criticism, and dealing with injury. I believe we see athletes as almost superhuman and that they have no emotion beyond their sport. Because we see athletes like this, the sports psychology field in collegiate sports started off very small and they were not able to receive the proper care and support they needed. Now, sports psychology has grown larger and larger and we are able to learn more about why athletes uh, feel stressed in their sport. The NCAA has continued to provide resources for athletes struggling for mental health issues. These resources include therapy, on-campus counseling, and a sports psychologist. If the NCAA can continue to provide these resources into the universities, we will see less suicide in sports and less mental health issues in Division I athletes.
But the harder I tried, the weaker I became. The current became too strong. I couldn't find my footing. I couldn't fight it. Not alone. After some encouragement from a friend, I met with Farah, the sports counselor for the athletic department. After a few sessions, I learned coping strategies to deal with the constant pressure of measurement. Barb helped me raise my head from the endless current. I lost my footing here and there, but the people around me helped pull me out. One of my biggest fears was telling my coach, the disappointment, the judgment. But instead, I was met with overwhelming support and guidance. For him, asking for help wasn't a weakness. It was a strength. I'm still learning how to find my identity outside of my sport. But I'm not letting a measurement, a number, or a time define who I am. Maybe one day I'll open a pool of my own. And I'll teach the lifeguards one thing. Look for people drowning on the inside. Your mental health is just as important as your physical health. Don't suffer in sadness. Our doors are always open. You can pause it now. Now I chose this video because I think it perfectly demonstrates how an athlete really suffers from mental health issues. For my internship, I spent 22 hours with Caitlin Harlow Burner, the coordinator of mental health services at Flavana County Public Schools. Caitlin taught me a lot about what it is like to work in the field of psychology and most importantly, I learned that it is not an easy field to work into, but it is definitely worth helping people. Together, Caitlin and I met with a few coaches around our uh, high school and talked to them about the resources they have to offer high school athletes who are struggling for mental health issues. She was also able to connect me with Karen Egan, a UVA sports psychologist, who gave me some insight on what it is like to be a sports psychologist at a university and how they can help Division I athletes. For my community service, I spent 12 hours with Ready Kids in Charlottesville. Ready Kids is a nonprofit organization that works with families who have children that have experienced a traumatic event. At Ready Kids, I supervised these children while their parents would go into focus groups, and I created fun activities and played games with them while we were there. My community service mentor, Eileen Barber, is the lead communication specialist at Ready Kids. She was a huge help through my community service process. She, she assisted me in supervising the kids, creating activities, and playing games with them. My advice for future seniors is to pick your research topic early. At the start of my senior year, I bounced between topics and ultimately landed on this one, but it made it harder to find internship and community service opportunities. Take pictures. Pictures are important for your project and will leave a lasting memory for yourself. Uh, start your research paper early. I also started my research paper a little bit late and it made it a little harder to get a jump start on my website. And finally, have fun. This project is the highlight of BRVGS and you can choose any topic you want to, so choose one that you enjoy and have fun with it. For my future plans, I plan to get my bachelor's degree in psychology at App State University. I, after those four years, I plan on getting my master's in sports psychology and hopefully work as a professional sports with a professional sports organization as a sports psychologist. Does anyone have any questions? Yes. I was wondering if you had any um, interviews with, with Division I athletes and what they, what they found to be like a shock, like, holy cow, I had no idea this was going to be my life, you know, going from a, like a, a right. competitive Right. No, I wasn't able to talk to any Division One athletes, but I was able to talk to some at the D3 level because I used to play soccer with them. And they told me that they struggled uh, a lot with, like, balancing academics and, you know, 
not starting on a team and like not being the best player on that team made it really difficult going into that. But they were able to find their footing and uh, their coaches helped them a lot and uh, on-campus counseling helped them as well. Yes, Kessler. Um, no, probably not. I mean, football, maybe because it's just like the biggest out of all of them, but I wouldn't say there was one specific sport. Yes, Mr. Gibson. Recently now, Mm -hmm. NIL, yep. I didn't come across anything, but I would, with my research, I would assume that NIL, um, making money in like college sports, now that they can make like millions of dollars, it will have a huge effect on their mental health. But like I said, if the NCAA can continue to push these resources into the universities, it shouldn't be a problem. Yeah, Lionel. Mm -hmm. No, not less stressful. I would say they're all probably equal. I mean, I'm sure there are some where you could see higher cases in mental health issues and suicide, but I, I didn't find that, so I don't know.
Hello everybody, my name is Taylor Weber and like Mr. Morrison said, I'm going to be talking about how your physical image can impact your mental health. Just to get started, a little bit about me is obviously I am a senior here and I've been a part of the cosmetology program here at FCHS for three years now. Our program is a little bit unique as it is three years whereas other programs are only two years. We just take that extra year to make sure that you can get everything down packed and that you're very comfortable with the hands-on and written portions. And for anybody who doesn't know, you do take at the end of the course a state boards exam. It's basically for your state. You take a practical, which is a written 100 question test basically. It can range from anything from nails, hair, to anatomy. And you also take a hands-on portion. So the hands-on portion, you're just going to simulate a typical salon endeavors. And like you're basically performing on a client, you do hair coloring, haircuts, and everything in between. And I chose this project mainly because I am in the cosmetology program. And that led me into my main research question which is how physical image can impact mental health in adolescent girls. I chose adolescent girls specifically, mainly because I fall into that category and many of my peers do as well. I wanted to be able to have a more personal experience and be able to talk to not only my friends, but my peers and the student body. And for my internship, I completed it at the Fifth Street Haircuttery with Miss Makisha or Keisha Chambers. Miss Chambers was my previous teacher here at FCHS. She taught here for two years while I was in the program. She did leave this past year and that is what made me want to pursue her. I learned from her very well and she taught me a lot while she was here at FCHS and I wanted to continue her to be able to teach me outside of school. So I pursued her and messaged her and she said that she would love to have me in the salon. And in the salon, I got lots of experience. While I didn't get to do things hands-on to clients, I did get to watch her complete services and really just talk to clients and understand how they felt. And throughout this project and my internship, I got to have conversations, I got to meet new people, and really just understand the ins and outs of everyday salon use and care. And while I was there, I did take many appointments, schedule many appointments for all of the stylists, not just Miss Chambers. And as well as maintaining a clean salon environment, I helped out to sweep up maybe some hair that was on the ground, clean color bowls, whatever it may be that they needed. As you can see on the first image here to the left, there is a woman with pink hair. This was one of my most notable experiences in my internship because this woman came in, she originally had brown hair when she came into the salon and she was actually pregnant. She did not know what she was having and she trusted Miss Chambers to totally transform her hair into a different color, whether it be blue or pink. And in the end, she ended up loving the results, but she did not know until the very end which color it would be. And that was just really heartwarming as a just person witnessing it. She went through all of like the stages. She was very emotional just because this was obviously the life that she was bringing to the world. And she got to find out through this. She was a stylist and that's why she chose to reveal it in this way. And then the other picture here on the right, on the left side of that is a 90 degree haircut. So it's gonna be everything basically pulling it straight out from the head. Whereas on the other side is a 180 degree haircut, which you pull everything straight up. As you can see, there is a pretty significant difference between the two. However, the only difference when you're actually doing the cut is, your, is the angle of the hair and the position of your fingers. 
which I thought was really interesting because I never knew that I would use my math skills in cosmetology. For my community service, I actually completed it here at FCHS. I wanted to really just make sure I was focusing on my adolescent girls, my um, specific area, and that's why I did it under Miss Lisa Adams, who is the current FCHS cosmetology teacher here, and she is amazing. She was here to supervise me the whole time, and this I really used my skills from my internship into my community service because of the fact that while I couldn't do these services outside of the classroom in a real salon, I could complete them here in our classroom under supervision. So I did carry a lot of over a lot of my skills that I learned in my internship into my everyday um, activities completing my community service. For my community service, I did provide appointments or walk-ins for students here. I did not just limit this to girls because I thought that everybody should have this opportunity. However, it was ma the majority of women that came in. Um, I did complete a haircut and a hair color and several hair washes as well as stylings and some manicures and nail care. What I learned about myself is that I can persevere through a lot. I initially did not want to complete my community service here. I wanted to try and find a larger scope, but that proved to be very difficult in reaching out to people. A lot of unanswered phone calls, emails, text messages, whatever it may be. And I learned that I also wanted to initially start my project with something more like social media marketing and how social media impacted the beauty standards. Instead, I ended up switching that over because I did kind of find a passion and love for teaching, and I wanted to carry that over to my project, and that is why I chose two teachers, or Ms. Chambers was a teacher, and so I chose two teachers for that just so that I could really see how they taught a class or an individual in, my, in the case of my internship, and how, that would go about, how I would go about doing that if I were to pursue that. My advice for any incoming seniors is to, number one, trust yourself. You've got this. It's a huge project. I know it can be very scary, especially like this part, getting up here and talking on stage. But if you take it piece by piece and really just break it down, it really isn't that scary when, you looking at, when you're looking at it at a very fine point view, whereas when you back it all up and look at it overall, it can be very daunting. And then to secondly, trust your, or trust your advisors because they're here for you no matter what. They're great resources to bounce ideas off of and really just, they give you ideas and you can go and expand on that or make those connections to people. And sometimes they may not always work out, but it's always nice to have a second opinion and be able to discuss. As for my future plans, I'm currently undecided as to where I'm going to go, but I have decided that I'm going to study elementary education and pursue that teaching career. Any questions? <laughs> yes, ma'am. Well, here at FCHS, we do, are doing an open salon thing now. So, like, it didn't just start with me, but I sort of continued it and propelled it forward that we do offer services here in our salon in the classroom. You just have to email the teacher or um, get in contact with her somehow. You have to, do have to sign a permission slip just saying that everything's okay, but it is free to students. Um, tips are appreciated but not required. And so any student can come in at any time and have whatever service they may wish. Yes, Kessler. Um, yes, mainly in my younger sister. My sister is only 12 years old. And recently she is running track now, but before she kind of struggled with mental health and she would come home and say that 
she wasn't skinny enough or she wasn't fit enough. And I really just wanted to create this presentation to really show her that it's not all about that and that she can move forward through that. Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Sarah Beth, and today I'm presenting about affordable and sustainable architecture in underserved communities. So a little insight onto, into how I landed on this project topic. I knew I wanted to go in the architecture route because I've been passionate about design for many years. Ever since middle school, I've been fascinated by floor plans. I've always been sketching house plans in my notebooks. Um, so that's why I decided to go with architecture. And then the sustainability factor came in because of a more recent interest of mine. I've become passionate about climate change over the past few years. And then I decided to go with um, underserved communities because I'm, I've also been involved in community service for many years. So I really wanted to keep that involved in my project. And I actually got firsthand experience serving the underserved with my community service. Last June, I went on a week-long trip with Appalachia Service Project to Wise County in Southwest Virginia, where my team and I were tasked with the project of reconstructing this deck for an elderly handicapped woman. And we started by ripping off the rotted plywood that was the original flooring of the deck. And then this is what our progress was looking like. And then we started replacing the joists, which are the support beams that run the length of the deck. And then this is what our progress looked like. And then just as we were starting to replace the perpendicular joists, the shorter ones um, for extra support, we ran into a bit of a hiccup because we realized that the underneath of the deck was exposed to the crawl space and the new uh, flooring beams that we were planning to lay for the new deck had left spacing in between for rainwater to filter through. And then that would have been an issue to have rainwater in the crawl space because that was a storage area. So the homeowner's items would have been molded and rotted and eventually destroyed. So we had to backtrack a little bit and replan and build this weatherproof wall underneath the deck which is a little difficult to see, but it's that white wall. And um, this delayed us a few days, but ultimately this is our final product. And I'm very proud of it. And I'm proud that despite the delay of having to build the weatherproof wall, I'm proud that we completed the project. But more, important, more importantly, I'm proud of leaving a lasting impact because 
Um, right after my team left, we got a message that the homeowner's neighbors saw her bring out her rocking chair onto the deck, and she was really just enjoying the fresh air and enjoying our work. So I'm proud that I was able to be a part of that and create something that she'll appreciate for the rest of her life. Moving on, and then this was my mentor throughout the process. This is Mr. Mike Wilkerson. He was our pretty much leader for construction and he taught me everything I now know about outdoor construction. Beforehand, I didn't even know what a joist was, but now I'm pretty confident in my outdoor construction skills, so I'm very thankful to him. And then I also gained experience working with the team, and I think I actually have a few of my team members here, Miss Mallory Esch and Miss Maddie Esch. My guys, snaps to them. Um, and I also, had experience working through obstacles with a team because we had that we had to backtrack and build that weatherproof wall and work together and be resilient in the face of that challenge and we kind of reassigned roles to best suit everyone's strengths so that we could work more diligently to make up for that lost time. And then moving on into the next portion of my project was my professional learning experience and I interned with architect Chris Henningsen in Charlottesville and I did two sessions with him. And one session, I got to go on a client meeting with him, and his client recently bought this historic home in Charlottesville, and they were planning to renovate it. So I got to go with him and meet with the client and see how he communicates with clients and then plans for home renovations. This is at the back of the house where they are planning to add an extension on the first floor. Uh, they're planning to add an extra formal dining room and then on the second floor, they are adding an additional guest bedroom. So after we got back to the office after the client visit, I got to sketch out plans of the current home, and then I also got to sketch out plans of the home plus the additions, which was also very exciting for me because like I said earlier, I'm very fascinated by floor plans and I love to draw them. And then I also got to see how their assistant transfers those handwritten plans into their virtual software. So that was very cool to learn about as well. So what I gained from this experience was learning what it's like in the professional architecture world. I got to see how he interacts with clients and um, how he makes his work work for the clients because um, the clients needs have to be met and then architects work together with clients to make sure that everything is feasible and attainable. And then I also got to learn about the architectural process, specifically how civil engineers are involved, especially with a historic, uh, with a historic landmark like this house. Um, every renovation has to be approved through civil engineers and it has to be approved through the Historic Architectural Board of Albemarle County, which I had no idea that that even existed. So I was really excited to learn about that. And then the last portion of my project is my research, which uh, I actually played around with a few different research questions before landing on my final one. I, during my preliminary research, I landed on one statistic that really, uh, that really, um, helped me figure out what I wanted to do exactly for my research. This was an estimated 6,529 people in Virginia are homeless every night. So when I found this out, I knew I wanted to research why is homelessness still a pertinent issue in Virginia? Because I'm familiar with organizations like Appalachia Service Project and Habitat for Humanity that are dedicated to making homes more affordable and more accessible. So I wanted to figure out why is homelessness still an issue if we have organizations like these. And I found that this is due to three main reasons. The first being increased home prices. With the COVID-19 pandemic, the cost of living and home prices increased across the country. But gradually, as we've gotten further from 2020, other states have managed to bring their home price indexes down every year but Virginia's has remained high and we're actually at an increasing rate. So that contributes to the large homeless population in Virginia because many people just can't afford homes. And then the second reason is um, home buyer patterns because 
with the COVID-19 pandemic, fewer senior citizens moved into assisted living facilities and retirement homes. So their homes are not on the market. And then the, home, the fewer homes that are on the market are more expensive because they're in higher demand. So again, a lot of people just can't afford to buy homes. And the last reason is climate change. We have a large population on the coast in Chesapeake and Virginia Beach, and they face high flooding every year as water levels rise. So it's really expensive to maintain homes in Virginia, especially for people who are experiencing high flooding because just a few inches of flood damage can cost the, a Virginia resident $25,000 to repair. And then when they're facing those costs year after year, that's really hard to maintain. So people lose their homes or choose to not buy a home. And then to move into a little reflection over my entire capstone project, I learned a lot about myself throughout this process, mostly how I react to stress. Um, I experienced stress with my community service when we had that delay of having to build the extra weatherproof wall but I learned that that made me work harder and the added pressure really motivated me to finish the project. And then I was also stressed trying to find my research question, but uh, ultimately that added pressure again made me work more diligently. And then if I could go back and change anything about my research, about my capstone pro project, I would definitely start my research earlier because like I said, my internship and my community service were both back in June, but then my research has been more recent throughout the winter. So I would have liked to start my research at the end of the summer or in the beginning of the fall to have it a more continuous process. And then advice I would give to future seniors, especially those who aren't sure what they wanna do for their project, I would definitely recommend finding something that you're passionate about to do your community service for or come up with ideas for community service because if you find something that you feel strongly enough about to serve your time and to volunteer your energy for, then that's probably a good indication that that's a subject that you'll be fascinated enough in to pursue research and to pursue a professional learning experience. And then lastly, my future plans are to attend the University of Virginia to major in civil engineering and construction management. Are there any questions? <laughs> yes, Taylor. Okay, so what was surprising about my community service? Um, we actually all week had to stay in an old high school so that was definitely surprising um, because the school is undergoing demolition on one half. So that added extra chaos to the experience. Um, and then we got stuck in a tornado, which was also very chaotic. But ultimately, we got the project done. So I'm really proud of our work. Yes, Lionel? So, are, so, correct me if I'm, all, I'm wrong, I think you're asking if relying on cars can potentially lower house prices? Um, no, relying on cars can increase, or can increase house, house prices and if car dependency, car dependency throughout our nation is possibly increasing, possibly, therefore. Okay, okay, I think I understand. So yes, I agree. Um, since we're so reliant on cars now, obviously like suburbs and outside areas far further outside cities are more populated, so more people are moving there. So then those home prices increase since they're more popular. So yeah, I could see how being less reliant on cars could decrease house prices. Any others?
Oh, yes. So it was a combination of youth and adults. It was actually a group of people from my church. So three students actually go here. Um, and then one other student goes to a different school. And then we had a few adults with us as well. So we were all working on the project together. But my mentor, Mr. Mike Wilkerson, was the, pretty much the lead of construction. So he was like teaching us what to do. So, you know, say, hey, so yes, yes, I agree. So it was through Appalachia Service Project, which is an organization um, that works in Kentucky, Tennessee, Southwest Virginia, and West Virginia. And they have an outreach program for people who need uh, construction repairs on their homes, but can't do it themselves or can't afford to pay for it. So then we were pretty much assigned, we were assigned that project through Appalachia Service Project. Any others? Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Derek Addison, and this is my senior capstone project on plea bargaining and its role within the criminal justice system. So just a little bit about myself. As I stated, my name is Derek Addison. I'm a senior here at Fulvana County High School. One thing about me is I really like golf. I've been on the varsity golf team here for the past two years. If you're ever looking for me or wondering where I am, I wouldn't check home first. I would check the golf course. So just very quickly, I wanted to share this quote with you all, um, specifically the last portion here where it states, where there is no law, there is no freedom. Throughout the entirety of my project, this quote has resonated within me uh, because I feel as if this quote makes me very intrigued in the law and its importance. Uh, John Locke said, we cannot have freedom without it. So that's something I've definitely kept in the back of my head. So why am I interested in law? Well, there's two main reasons why I'm interested in law. The first one is I was interested to see if this could be a possible career path for me. Uh, since a young age, I've been interested in the law. So when I had the opportunity to choose what I wanted to do my project on, it was a no-brainer, and I went with this topic. Also, my family. I have multiple family members who are involved in the law. So being around them constantly and hearing their conversations has further intrigued me uh, to pick this as my topic. So for my research, my research question was, what role does plea bargaining play within the criminal justice system? So before I get started, what is plea bargaining? Well, plea bargaining is essentially the collaboration between the prosecution and the defense to reach an agreement on a solution of a, of a court case such as like a sentence. So some of the results of my research, the one question that kept popping up throughout my research was, is plea bargaining or plea deals, are they an ethical or unethical solution to court cases? So through my research, I came to the conclusion that plea bargaining is an unethical solution. I say that for these two main reasons, those being 
Debugging has an inability to ensure quality legal representation for its clients, as well as it inspires many attorneys to commit legal wrongdoings to their clients. What I mean by this is the main problem that I found within plea bargaining is there are many instances where a client or an individual could be innocent, however their legal advisor, their attorney, coerces them and tries to get them to agree to a plea deal mainly because attorneys are very busy individuals, they have a large um, schedule book on the daily basis, so by getting through clients as quick as possible, they tend to resort to plea bargaining because it is a swift resolution to many court cases. I believe that this is, one of the main reasons it is unethical is because many of these lawyers, instead of doing what is right in the eyes of the law and their job, they tend to look to maximize either financial gain by getting in more clients or just getting through their client, clientele instead of actually investing the time and effort and fighting for them to make sure that they get the represent, representation they deserve. So some solutions that I found in my research to plea bargaining are, one, a complete ban of it. Now a complete ban is very, would be very difficult to obtain. However, the most likely way that we could ban plea bargaining would be passing some uh, form of legislation or giving more power to the judge in the courtroom and taking power away from the attorneys. Not all, but some. Also, one really interesting thing I found in my research was that being a lawyer is extremely stressful. Lawyers have some of the highest rates of alcoholism, drug abuse, and overall depression. So by offering more rehabilitation opportunities to many lawyers, they can, we can uh, ensure that more lawyers are able-minded to provide the best legal representation for their clients. So about my professional learning experience, I interned at the Flavana County Commonwealth Attorney's Office with my mentor, Mr. Jeffrey Hayslip. Mr. Ha uh, Hayslip is the Commonwealth Attorney here in Flavana County. He's been an attorney at law for the past 25 years. He went to James Madison University and then went on to Capital University to study law. So before I get into what I learned from my uh, professional learning experience, I just want to say a quick disclaimer. Unfortunately, I was not able to get as many pictures as I would have liked for this project as I was going into court constantly and watching confidential uh, videos and reading doc documents that I'm not allowed to photograph and publicize for this project. However, that did not take away my experience. I learned a lot, as I stated earlier. I am curious to see if law is what I want to go to in the future. And Mr. Hayslip did a great job of teaching me the ins and outs of what it's like to be an attorney. As you can see here, this is my setup in the Commonwealth Attorney's Office. On that desktop right there, I watch things such as police body cam footage, um, listen to phone calls from incarcerated individuals at regional county jails, as well as these folders right here that contain documents and information on people involved with court cases coming up that me and my mentor, Mr. Hayslip, reviewed together and he gave me the overall experience of what it's like to be an attorney on the daily basis. For my community service, I worked with the Vilvana County Sheriff's Office to create a project to bring to the student population here, educating them on laws that affect their daily lives that they may not be aware of. So I worked with Captain Vaughn Hill and the Vilvana County Sheriff's Office, as well as the school SRO here, Sergeant Joshua Green. The first part of my community service project was I made these posters. I worked with the sheriff's office to come up with the basis of these posters. We talked about some issues we feel like are prevalent here at the school and laws that cover them. Some of these include the punishments for offensive language, cyberbullying and harassment, as well as assault and battery. The second portion of my project was I used the information I gathered from researching about these laws what I learned from the sheriffs and these posters to create a presentation which I presented to the 8th grade civics classes as well as the 12th grade government classes. I wanted to get both demographics of younger students and older students because both groups are starting something new in their lives. 8th graders are coming into the high school. It's a new environment for them. So being educated on 
rules that affect their daily lives, is, I felt it was important, as well as seniors who are getting ready to leave high school, go to college, go to work, be involved in society. I feel like it's very important to educate students now instead of them not know and later get in trouble for something that they could have been educated on. And I can be assured that my community service was educational and my topic was, in fact, real because I sent out a survey after I pre presented this interview and 85% of students that took the survey said that they did learn something, which means that they were not aware of these laws. So if they were to get in trouble for something like this, then they wouldn't have been aware, obviously. So I feel like I did a great job with my community service, not to toot my own horn, but yeah. So what I learned about myself for this presentation, well, it assured me of my career choice. Nothing is ever 100%. However, I do feel very confident moving forward that law is something that I want to pursue as a career and put my time and effort into. Uh, I have to give a huge credit to Mr. Hayslip. He really was the one that confirmed this for me. Uh, by watching him on his daily basis and what we did during that learning experience has 100%, without a doubt, made me more interested in law and is something I want to pursue. So for my advice to rising seniors, I say work efficiently, but do not take every shortcut. This project is, can be long, it can be difficult, and overwhelming at times, so shortcuts do look very appealing. However, what I say is don't take every shortcut. Sometimes by taking the long road, you can pick up new skills along the way, and it's also much more rewarding when you get done with whatever you're working on. So for my future plans, I either am planning on attending James Madison University or West Virginia University. If I attend West Virginia, I'll have access to their law program there. However, if I attend James Madison, I'll need alternative in-state law schools, and I'm thinking of William & Mary, University of Virginia, or the University of Richmond. Any questions? <laughs> yes, Ms. I'm just curious what the kids were most interested in. So were they no surprise about age or Yeah, definitely. So just by doing the presentation and looking around the room, I actually saw this one eighth grade girl, her jaw completely dropped when I told her about the punishments for offensive language. Uh, I explained how by uh, disturbing the peace in a school hallway that you can be uh, charged up to a $500 fine just for saying some language in the hallway. And I feel like that got the most reaction out of um, the group. Yes, sir. Definitely. Uh, there is definitely a, a, a confliction there. Um, the, the stance that I took on this presentation was if you are using plea bargaining to get at larger criminals, for example, I think that that personally completely disregards the lower level criminals, you could say, um, because everyone has the right to a fair trial and not to say that they're unfair. However, I just feel like every single person who is in a court or being prosecuted or whatever it is, they deserve the best legal representation that they can get. So if I feel like as if attorneys are just using them just to get information and they don't really care about the outcome of their case, I feel like that is unethical. Mr. Pace. Uh, we touched on it. Uh, I didn't get into it as much because that was mainly what I focused my research paper on. Um, I feel like he's pretty, from what I understood, I feel like he's pretty neutral on it. He didn't have much of an opinion. Um, but we did, we did touch base. Yes, sir. So I didn't get into actual court cases. However, I did get into a study um, in my paper regarding um, the role that specifically court-appointed attorneys have in the courtroom, who court-appointed attorneys are the most common in plea bargain cases. Uh, it was a study done in Hong Kong and they found that these court-appointed attorneys were completely saying what is in the best interest of the client. However, when they interviewed the clients, they said that they would rather have their attorneys fight for them in court to p potentially have no sentence. But the attorneys, since they want to, I guess, as I said, they're busy, they want to 
get through their schedule as quick as possible, and that is plea bargaining, which isn't always what's in the best interest for the client. I hope that answers your question to an extent. Yes, Lionel. Uh, so you were talking about the actual development of the contract and the uh, like the potential embodiments, mm. et cetera. Um, did that have any impact on the actual product that you were negotiating or the project that you were negotiating? So I would say that it didn't. I'm um, assuming you're referring to seeing some things on the body cam footage that may have affected my mental health. No, most of the stuff that he showed me was um, strictly educational. I didn't get, obviously, full access to what he was looking at because I'm not an attorney. However, I'd say that I actually enjoyed most of the things I watched. I feel like it was really interesting, and as I said, it helped me in my decision to be an attorney. What else? Thank you. Down, and that's the yeah, laser pointer. Testing, testing. Okay. No. No. <laughs> Good afternoon. My name is Lionel Strauss, and this afternoon I'll be presenting to you on artificial intelligence in the world. Um, so just before I get on with the rest of my presentation, I want to clarify a couple of acronyms and terms I'll use and put a definition to them as to prevent confusion. The first of which is AI, which is short terminology for artificial intelligence, which is the use of computational hardware and software in order um, to use, create technology that's able to mimic human intelligence. The second of which is a subsector, a subset of AI, which are LLMs, which stands for large language models, which are AI models that are trained on large amounts of text-based um, data in um, hopes to be able to mimic human conversation, um, interact with humans via text, um, and be able to predict human text.
Um, so how, how did I get to AI? So a few things about me. I'm an avid chess and Tetris player. I love strategy games and I love puzzles. I'm also a maths enthusiast. I do math for fun. I know you guys are probably thinking that I'm crazy right now. It's okay. Um, so I knew that I wanted to do something in STEM. And furthermore, I am very active in our school's music community. I have held multiple leadership positions in our marching band and have soloed multiple times in our concert bands. And these are just a couple of pictures, me with the school tuba and me playing two games of time chess at once. So why AI? Um, the first reason is Miss Bridge. So after one of her calculus lectures last year in late February or early March, instead of doing my homework, I instead was playing around with chat GPT. And I soon realized the global relevance and impact that this technology would have. Um, this technology was able to have almost human-like conversations with me, and this it was unlike anything I'd ever seen. Which takes me to my quote of quality from Stephen Hawking. Success in creating AI would be the biggest event in human history. Unfortunately, it may also be the last unless we learn how to avoid the risks. And that's really set the mood for my overall um, capstone project. So I did my professional learning um, experience under my mentor, Ramel Tallin, through AI Safety Camp, which is um, an organization that takes graduate students and scholars of a similar caliber and really um, asks them to do research as to the risks of AI and how to mitigate said risks. Um, throughout my presentation, I did my presentation, um, or throughout my internship, um, which I did virtually. He was located in Amsterdam, Hong Kong, and Australia. So there were many times when I was um, scheduling meetings at some wee hour of the morning um, in order for it to be some decent hour of the morning for him. Um, but fr from our first conversation, I really realized that um, he was a very community-oriented person who believed in organic relations. And what I mean by that is more so that he believes in interacting with your um, geographically local community instead of partaking in global internet um, communities. And I get that that's ironic given that this was a virtual, um, a virtual um, internship, but um, yeah. So for my professional learning experience, I did guided research um, as to the ethics of the environmental impacts of AI hardware. Um, my main points of focus were um, that of mi mineral extraction in Southeast Asia, how that affects local small communities, how that impacts aquaculture um, opportunities for said communities, and also in the after effect of AI hardware, once we dispose of it, once it becomes outdated. Um, and generally, e-waste is uh, exported because of how cheap it is to Africa, specifically Nigeria, but due to a lack of legislation. And this causes numerous health um, issues in local populations um, to the point where the UN has actually tried to intervene on multiple occasions, but has not been able to successfully fix this problem. And I wasn't able to take many interesting pictures of my internship because it was a virtual internship. Um, but this was my research setup. Um, and this is a picture of me preparing for a meeting in our school library. Um, now for my research paper, I wanted to answer the question, can or should LLMs be used as a tool in high school education? And going into this, I thought I, it would, I thought I would be in favor of using AI as a tool, using LLMs as a tool. But coming out of it, I realized that it was a bad idea for many reasons. The first of, the first of which is the implications for teachers. Although students and parents really don't like to admit it, um, teachers are humans. They're employees that have rights. Um, and if we're replacing them with AI, um, the Khan Academy has recently released an LLM model that, for very little money, can act as a private tutor. So that begs the question, what if we just replace teachers? Um, so that's going to leave a large part of our, our workforce, roughly 2.5% of our workforce, um, unemployed if we were to do that. The second of which is political alignment. So in non-STEM subjects, social studies, humanities, etc., um, you don't want to have a politically biased teacher 
And a large problem with political alignment in AI is that AI is strained on data sets. And data is inherently by nature biased. So you're always going to have some sort of political alignment issues in an AI uh, model. So it's possible that that, view, that bias can be transposed down into students. And lastly is the necessity of human interaction. Um, Brenna spoke on this earlier, but um, we already saw the effects of COVID, what, it had, what that had on our um, students. We've been seeing the lowest math and English um, test scores we've seen in decades um, as a long-term impact. And um, yeah, just coming back to what my mentor for my um, internship told me, like the necessity of human interaction, that's how we create um, reliable, um, reliable and um, eight reliable citizens in our country. Um, and that, after that, I went to my community service, um, which I did at the high school um, with the help of Mr. Morrison, Ms. Elliott, and Ms. Alden. Um, and I really wanted to help um, bring AI into our education system as a tool rather than, a, as a tool for education rather than a tool for cheating because Realistically, it is easy for students to cheat using AI models. Um, you type in a question, it'll spew out an answer that's almost all the time probably better than what the student could have written. Um, so yeah, I made a module um, in order to, I made a module in order to um, help educate our local SEHS classes um, as to how to use AI ethically in academic work. Um, and I presented to five of those classes um, under classman classes. Um, and right now I'm talking with Ms. Elliott as to possibly using this for future freshman classes in governor's school. Um, and here's a couple, sorry, here are a couple of pictures of me teaching to Ms. Esch's class. And self-reflection. So this experience was amazing. I've grown so much as a person and going into it I thought I was doing AI because it was a STEM field and I didn't realize how it was actually not just STEM, it's everything. You need to understand politics, you need to understand economics, you need to really understand everything to get a full picture of the impacts that AI will have on our world. And I think that that will really in the future help me um, to, do, to work in interdisciplinary fields um, and that brings me to my future plans, which is to study math and physics at one of the uh, for, uh, of one of the above universities. I currently haven't heard back from Caltech or U Chicago, but I've been accepted into the rest of the schools up there. And my advice: um, prioritize what's important to you. So your senior year is kind of crazy. Um, you have college applications. You're probably taking the SAT, extracurriculars, etc. Um, and this project is amazing. It's a great learning experience, personal growth opportunity, etc. But sometimes it's okay not to be a perfectionist and to maybe prioritize, say, getting a better SAT score studying for the SAT or getting a better college, um, a college essay in um, at the expense of maybe having a somewhat imperfect project. And I really wish I had done that, especially for my Caltech application. Thank you. Questions? <laughs> Kessler. Uh, you talked earlier about how the um, panel could collaborate on that a little bit. Yeah, so um, this isn't a new problem. This has been a problem for decades. Um, countries worldwide send e waste, electronic waste to African countries, and specific Nigeria more than others, um, because they're able to do it for less of a cost than it would be to responsibly dispose of um, within their country. And that's due to the fact that Nigeria has almost no legislation in place for the um, safe disposal of um, electronic waste. So that leads to a lot of things when there's precipitation um, that leads to t toxic runoff, which harms agricultural land. Um, it also leads to health impacts. It, um, I think the life expectancy um, has decreased in some countries, or not countries, in some communities by as much as 15 years. 
um, and various other defects in children that are born into these communities. Ms. Hagan. Who is leading the charge to make sure that the doom and gloom portion of the closed doesn't come through? That's the neat part. There isn't. Um, so, okay, there kind of is. Um, but it's much more at a grassroots level at this point. Um, because when you look at it, if you're even looking at um, Biden's um, plans for AI, that's written up by Meta, OpenAI, at Microsoft. So there is definitely corporate interest in these, in, in these things. There's military defense um, interest. So in many ways, the government and corporations are pushing AI technology as hard as they can, brute forcing it as much as they can. Um, because they know that um, in many ways there won't be, if another country catches up, especially in the military um, standpoint, then you're already at a disadvantage. So we're pushing AI technology. I don't think we should be. We should learn how to mitigate the risks, but it's sort of a catch-22 in that regard. Pessler, again. Um, the recently with um, Google, yeah, I think so. With the, um, I assume you're talking about um, the prompts that were spewing out um, historically incorrect images. Um, so that actually goes back to my political um, leaning thing. Um, this doesn't necessarily reflect my actual political thoughts, but Gemini is very obviously a left-leaning um, model. It's been trained on. Um, a lot of left-leaning data. Um, and so that's really why I'm concerned about using AI in education, because what if that ends up being what we're educating our students on, stuff that becomes historically inaccurate in order to push a um, political philosophy? Uh, Mr. Gibbons. Can you give us a personal Oh. Okay, so the most positive thing. Um, I think that AI has the potential, especially in the medical field, in the environmental field, um, to be used as a way to find unique solutions um, to problems. Because I was talking about the environmental impacts, yes, but the um, software itself is also capable of coming up with solutions to other environmental problems. Um, it's able, it probably in the next coming decades will be able to be used in the medical field. And the most negative, um, at this point, I would say probably it's within the education system that ability of students to cheat in um, the future may um, end up in a, in a doomsday scenario, <laughs> I mean, hypothetically a doomsday scenario. Um, but um, I won't get too far into that. That's another rabbit hole. Anyone else? Thank you. Hi, I'm Sierra, and my topic is on veterinary medicine, focusing more on small animals. So why this topic? Um, ever since I was a little kid, I've always loved to be around animals of all kinds, cats, dogs, dogs. And so naturally, I decided on a topic that would help uh, save them. 
And so for my internship, I got a total of 32 hours at Piedmont Veterinary Service, where I shadowed many of their veterinarians and vet technicians and vet assistants who each taught me a little bit something different about their specific role in the field. And so the vet, the vet assistants taught me more about the hands-on part and things like holding animals for uh, the physical examinations, as well as communicating with uh, the pet owners. The vet technicians taught me more about the, um, the actual medicine and things like uh, performing heartworm tests and looking at different things under the microscope, like uh, heartworms and um, blood samples and things like that. And then the veterinarians taught me more about the actual physical examinations. And so one of the vet technicians, Ellie Zeller, who was my mentor, really liked to collect things that she found interesting. And so one of those things is blood samples. And this picture on the right is her collection over the years. And I thought it was very interesting to look at these under the microscope because you could really see the different platelets and the white blood cells and the red blood cells. And I found it very interesting. And then the picture on the left shows um, the blood sample from a dog named Hank, who was actually at the clinic. And so I got to see the entire process of you know, drawing up their blood and then actually doing the smear and then looking at it under the microscope. And then this little cat had a very interesting story. So he came in with his pet owner who said that he had been hit by a car, but they didn't think anything was wrong with it. However, it was very clear to the vets that his jaw was broken because it had been shifted over when it should have been straight. And so they ended up surrendering the cat or giving him up because he needed surgery. And so the clinic ended up doing the surgery and the cat lived. However, his jaw had to be immobilized and so he couldn't chew up his food. And so a tube had to be inserted, which is what you can see on the right, the little orange thing sticking out of its neck. It was a tube that went down into its neck and into its throat and then down into its stomach so that the veterinarians could um, push food down and feed him. And then one interesting fact about this little cat is that he had an extra toe on each of his front feet. And so it made it look like he had mittens on that you can see on the left. And so that's what everyone would call him, mittens. And he ended up going home with one of the veterinarians, Dr. Grover. And then I couldn't take many pictures of the actual animals, and so I did take pictures of the inside to show what, like, where everything was and where everything happened. And so this was the room where the medicine was, which was pretty well organized alphabetically. And so when I would help them count different pills and things like that for, to put in the bottles, um, they would just tell me the name of the, the medication and so I could go and find it and it made it really easy. And then, these two rooms were where the physical examinations happened. The room on the left was more open, and so usually the animals were, the animals that were in there were usually nicer. And this room also had the scale that was used to weigh the animals, as well as the fridge that you can see was used for um, storing their, uh, some of their food and then some of the vaccinations as well. And then the room on the right was more secluded, and so usually the animals that were in there were not as nice. And so the clinic would try to minimize the amount of stress and distractions for the animals as much as possible. And then this room was used solely for surgeries. The only surgeries that I remember them actually doing is spay and neuters, but I didn't actually get to see them do any of them. And then this room had a couple different purposes. This table that the arrow is pointing to was for dentistry, which is kind of like a surgery, but they did it here because it was easier to clean up. And then this arrow is pointing to the ultrasound machine. Um, and I actually did get to see one of these performed, which was pretty cool. And then this was the x-ray machine. And so for community service, I got a total of 11 hours where I made these cute little bags to donate to the Fluvanna SPCA to give out to people who adopt. Um, and my, my supervisor was Sarah Lloyd, who was a coordinator there. And she helped me come up with the idea. Uh, and I basically did this in four steps. I split it up into like four different days. And so the first day, I wrote these cute little thank you cards to put in each of the bags. You know, I thought this was a very um, good way to show gratitude and appreciation for the people who adopt because it, it's not an easy decision to adopt instead of buying from a breeder because usually shelter dogs tend to be a little bit more um, challenging to like train and things like that. And then the second step, I made these cute little uh, rope toys to, for the dogs. 
And this is basically my process. I made these out of just old shirts and things that I had. And I basically just knotted one end and then braided them and knotted the other end. And they turned out pretty good. The third step, I went shopping. Um, this is basically my pile of all the supplies that I had gotten. And then this is what went into each of the bags. It wasn't really a lot, but um, it, was, it was pretty good. The picture on the left was for dogs and the picture on the right was for cats. Uh, and then my fourth step, I dropped them off at the SBCA. I ended up making a total of 20 bags, 10 for cats and 10 for dogs, which doesn't really seem like that big of a number, but when you think about how many animals are actually adopted, it, it was a pretty good amount that I was, I was satisfied with. And then the picture on the right shows me and my sister dropping them off at the SBCA. And the overall impact of this community service was um, directly on the people as well as the animals. So it really helped the people who adopt um, feel appreciated and because it, it's not an easy job to adopt and take care of an animal. And then for the animals, it helped because it gave them a little cute little toys and treats to take home. So for research, I am an AP research student, and so all of my research and my research paper is being completed in that class, and so I do not currently have any results. But my research question is, what are the long-term effects and financial burdens associated with different cancer treatments, and how does this affect a penogenesis decision for treatment? And like I said, I do not currently have the conclusions or any results. So my advice for future Blue Ridge students is don't procrastinate and pick a topic that you're passionate about. So from personal experience, procrastination causes a lot of unnecessary stress that could have been avoided if I had just started early. So definitely start early. And then pick a topic that you're interested in because if not, this whole experience and project will be kind of boring. And I actually really enjoyed it because I picked something that I really liked. And what I learned, I learned patience. Uh, it was a very difficult and lengthy process um, finding an internship because a lot of the Clinics that I had contacted, they either already had someone or they didn't take anyone under 18 or, um, or they just didn't reply. And so I had to be patient and wait for an opportunity to arise. And then I also learned knowledge. Obviously, my knowledge obviously increased because, you know, I learned a lot of different um, veterinary medicine things like performing the heartworm test and then looking at the things under the microscope. And then I even made a couple of vaccinations as well. And this all helped solidify that this is what I want to do in the future as a career. And so I feel a lot more confident going into college after this experience because it really taught me that, you know, I do want to, I do want to be a veterinarian. Which brings me to my future plans, which is to attend Virginia Tech, majoring in animal science on a pre-vet track. Any questions? Um, it's mainly due, it's probably mainly due to um, all the things that veterinarians see, like um, especially within like when an animal is sick and there's nothing that can be done and they have to be put down, that can really uh, have a significant impact and decrease their mental health. Yes. Um, the, the cat story really, really helped with that because I did see one, um, one animal that was put down and it really, you know, I, I, I could feel the, the sadness coming from that owner. But then the cat story really helped to uplift me because, you know, the little cat survived and it was, it was great.
here one more time. Thank you, Gary. And uh, I'm getting ready to announce our last presenter today. Before I do that, I really want to thank uh, Ms. Elliot Bonovich, Tom, Claire. Uh, I came into this today because I hadn't done this in like a million years, and Ms. Esher has been taking care of this before, and I was a little nervous myself coming in here today. Ladies, oh my God. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Hayden Bridge. Uh, I'm a senior here at Fontana County High School, um, and my uh, I decided to do my uh, senior uh, capstone project on the benefits of music ed music education in high schools. Oh. So why did I pick this topic? Um, I've been involved in uh, music ever since middle school, um, and especially recently. Uh, last year I've taken pretty much every music class that's available here at the high school. Um, and I also have a very long family history uh, of music. Uh, my grandfather uh, was a traveling musician for the Salvation Army Band. Um, uh, and he really inspired me to kind of do music as a hobby. So my quote of quality is that uh, music is the mu movement of sound to reach the soul for the education of its virtue by Plato, which leads into my uh, research. My research question uh, is what are the benefits of music, ed music education in high schools? And during my research I found that the benefits are not uh, exactly what you'd think. Um, in a study done by Dr. Uh, Nierman, uh, an associate, associate professor of music at the uh, Teachers College of Nebraska uh, found that there is uh, no difference in ability to describe and verbalize uh, musical events between students who had taken uh, or have received a music education and students who have not. But that same study proved that students who had received a music education uh, scored higher on uh, literacy and math tests as well as had reduced levels of stress, uh, increased uh, memory and attention spans, and were just uh, happier in general. So, for my professional learning, I split my professional learning experience into two parts. Uh, for the first part, I uh, worked with the Blue Ridge Center for Music and Arts, um, and I attended a, a sound engineering uh, workshop uh, where I learned the basics of the physics of sound and how it, um, uh, sorry, uh, the physics of sound and how it applies to uh, music, spe uh, specifically like live uh, music. Um, so I learned how to uh, set up mics and connect them to soundboards, and also how to run those soundboards during a concert. So after the uh, workshop, I had an opportunity to work behind the scenes and set up all of the uh, equipment for the concert and then run sound uh, for a live uh, concert, uh, which was a bluegrass band uh, composed of uh, ex-U.S. Marines. Um, I worked with um, a sound engineer who's been in the industry for over 50 years. Uh, but unfortunately, he asked not to be named in my presentation. So for the second half of my um, professional learning experience, I worked uh, here at uh, Favannah County High School with uh, Mr. Sam Campbell, who is the director of the bands here at SCHS. Um, he graduated from JMU with a bach Bachelor of Music in Music Education. 
And I worked with him. Um, I spent a week uh, working with him and the uh, beginning band class here at Fulani County High School. Uh, for context, the beginning band is meant for first year high school uh, musicians uh, with the purpose of getting students who did not do band in middle school up to speed so that they can transition to symphonic band uh, next year. And it's open to any first year musician. So any, like you could be in 12th grade and still join the beginning band if you want. So while I was working with them, I um, helped with instruction. Uh, this is a picture of me teaching them the Wheel of Fifths, which is one of the like, fundamentals of music theory. And then I worked individually with uh, students in the low brass section, because that was my specialty. I would tutor them and help them prepare for their uh, winter concert. So for my community service, I yet again worked here at uh, Favannah County High School in collaboration with uh, uh, Mrs. Harkrader, who is the director of the choir uh, here. And I volunteered for the uh, all, uh, district choir and all Virginia auditions, which was held here at Favannah County High School. Um, whoops. So the first day, uh, which was the auditions for All Virginia. I spent the whole day in a, a judge room uh, assisting the adjudicators with administering the auditions. Um, and the reason they need a helper is because to ensure that um, the audition is solely based on uh, the musicians like talent and skill, the adjudicators are not allowed to see or talk to the musicians. Um, and I was not permitted to take pictures of the audition rooms because they are secretive in nature. For the second day, I was given the opportunity to run sound and uh, lights for the uh, district choir concert. Uh, here in this room, actually. Um, So the biggest thing I learned over the course of this project is that um, I love working with other musicians, whether it's behind the scenes setting up a concert or working one-on-one -on -one with a, a new musician. I really do love it, and it helped, it's kind of helped have some assurance that I you know, want to pursue music as a career after high school. So. The biggest piece of advice I have for any uh, uh, rising seniors is that no matter what you do, pick something that you love uh, for your topic because it'll never feel like a chore uh, to work on it. I was excited to come in every day for, uh, to work with the beginning band. I was excited to attend uh, my workshop and I was very excited to you know, have the opportunity to work with sound and other musicians. So it never felt like I was just, like it was a chore. And secondly, you've probably heard this for every other presentation so far, but do not procrastinate. Um, start early and manage your time um, because it will really help you out in the long run with managing stress and general uh, problems. Uh, so for my future, uh, I'm planning on attending uh, Shenandoah University uh, to pursue a Bachelor of Music uh, in Music Production and Recording Technology or Contemporary Musicianship and on, an Embedded Minor in Business. Uh, any questions?
I believe it was just for our region. Okay. So, you know, Albemarle, Orange, stuff like that. Uh, yes, I picked high school education because it's really where you get the most freedom to choose what you want to do uh, with music. Uh, here at the high school, we have three different bands, three different choirs, uh, intro to guitar, piano, uh, and music theory classes. So no matter what experience level you are or no matter what you want to do with music, there's a lot of options available to you. I get Lionel again. A uh, Bach. Uh, Kessler. Choir and band are very similar when in that kind of music education. The difference I did find um, was with students who just took like a piano or guitar classes as the, the rules there are slightly different. Um, and you learn different things in a choir or band class because you're learning how to be a musician in a group, in a group setting. Yeah, in my research I did find examples of students involved in music, music education having like lower stress levels or being happier in general. Uh, but even in my own personal experience, I struggle a lot with mental health and being around you know, other musicians has always helped me kind of feel like I belonged somewhere, like helped me calm down. Uh, so yes, I would believe, I'd, yeah. 